Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this OGSM expert webinar series on urogynecology. So just to give you a bit of a background, so this is actually a webinar organized by the OGSM. And this idea was conceived by Dr. Hu Mei Lin, who is the president elect. She may join us later in the day, I hope. And the reason I greeted good evening, um, it was intended to be sort of a sharing of urogynecology among some of our Malaysian gynecologists and trainees. However, I understand that we have participants from Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Mongolia, Brunei, and as far as South Africa, which is great. And I'm sure our expert panelists will be up to the challenge. So um, first and foremost, we are very fortunate and thankful to have um, three very expert panelists who are very experienced in the field and very passionate about teaching. And they've made sacrifices that we may not know of to be here with us today. And this is meant to be a webinar for the audience. So I hope that you will pose as many questions, ask anything to the panelists um, in the Q&A box below uh, throughout the lectures as well and I will direct them to the panelists at the end during the case discussions. So it's a lecture for you. So I hope everyone will make use of this session. Um, Clarence, if you will, I would like to introduce the speakers at this point. Okay, so our first speaker is, will be Associate Professor Suvit Bunavet Shevin. Um, he is currently the Chief of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine in Chulalongkorn University. He is a current executive board member as well as the chairperson of the Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery Committee of the Royal Thai College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He was the past president of the Thai Urogynecologist Society. He is a current board member of the Urogynecology Committee of the Asia Oceania Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology and he has more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals. And our second speaker will be Associate Professor Ng Kwok Wing, Dr. Roy. He is currently the Senior Consultant and Head of the Division of Urogynecology and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the National University Hospital Singapore, as well as the National University Singapore. Dr. Roy is very active in the activities of the International Urogynecology Society, IUGA, he was the past secretary of the term 2016 till 2019. He has been on the organizing committee of various annual meetings of IUGA across the world. And he will be chairing the local organizing committee of IUGA annual meeting in 2021, which is in Singapore. And Dr. Roy will speak to us about this later, in fact. And our last but not least, uh, Dr. Kong Su Yen, our very own consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. Dr. Kong, and urogynecologist. She is currently based at the Subang Jaya Medical Center. She was a former associate professor as well as consultant in obstetrics and gyne gynecology. Her interest was in the area and still is in the area of urogynecology and minimal excess surgery. Her passion for teaching is obvious in the fact that she was on the organizing committee of the APH 2014, ACOC 2015, as well as the APUGA meeting in 2018. So these are our expert panelists for today. Again, I thank them for being here with us today on a very busy, what would have been a very busy Saturday afternoon for them. So without further ado, I would like to pass uh, on to Associate Professor Suvit. He will deliver a lecture to us on um, vagina rejuvenation treatment in urogynecology. Dr. Suvit, if you will. Okay, one moment. Uh, let me chat a slide first. Can you hear me? Okay, you can yes, hear me, right? Yes, okay, yes, good. Let clear. me start. Okay. Okay, I think. Uh, so you all see my slide, right? Okay. Yes, okay. Dr. Suvit, we see you. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the Malaysian Eulogenical Society for inviting me to join this uh, really interesting webinar, right? So today I'm going to talk about the vaginal rejuvenation treatment in urogynecology. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, declare my conflict of interest. I have no money support for any drug or medical instrument company. The machine I'm going to uh, talk and using right now is a CO2 laser. The machine support 
I didn't get on the money only the I they the the the, the company the laser made company let me use that machine without without uh, the cost of of the machine for my study only. Okay. For the scope of my talking today, I'm going to talk about the definition of the vaginal rejuvenation, vaginal plasty, vaginal tightening. Uh, I'm going to give you the update information about the laser rejuvenation or the surgery te surgical technique and the take home message. If you check by the Google for the word vaginal reju rejuvenation, you will see that there's about, about 600,000 items found by the Google. Or even you use the laser labia rejuvenation or laser rejuvenation, you will find about 100, about 100,000 items found. The, but the Google, they give the def definition of the vaginal re uh, rejuvenation by a face lip of the vulva at the vagina. Usually, com usually it combines a vaginoplasty and labiaplasty together to improve the, uh, the outer appearance for, for a refreshed look and feel. But if you search by the PubMed, you will see that if the PubMed, there are only 97 items filed for the vaginal rejuvenation and 40 for the laser labia rejuvenation. Right. Uh, if you look at the detail, you found that all the 97 items, there were only 13 articles related to the vaginal reju rejuvenation. The rest are the review article about 30 items or there were not related 80 items. But one very really interesting for me and Dr. Roy, they're talking about the scrotal rejuvenation. Oh my God, you see that. They have a report, they have a suggest of doing the scrotal reju reju rejuvenation. So rejuvenation is not only for women, but only for the man with the relax of the scrotal sac. They say that uh, they can use some treatment to stop the scrotal for relaxation by using the medical treatment like midoxidil or oral finasteride or, in, or even use the laser to treat for the hypertrichosis of the scrotum and surgical intervention to stop the scrotal laxity by lifting the scrotal up. And even the hair transplant for the scrotal alopecia or inject of the Botox to stop the wrinkle. I think that I and Dr. Lloyd after got retirement, I will fly to this, this man is in, Fall, is in uh, San Diego, USA. Maybe I will went there, I will go there for <laughs> the scrotum rejuvenation. <laughs> for the vaginal rejuvenation, as I mentioned before, the clinica is all, all, only about 13 articles, mostly about the laser nine articles and one about the plasma rich injection, one article and about match and thread put in the vagina to make the rejuvenation of the vagina two articles and one talking about the fat injection. The other is about the letter to auditors and guideline six article. And for the laser vagin the for the laser rejuvenation, it's quite similar with the vaginal rejuvenation. So the problem is the defi definition of the word vaginal rejuvenation. In 2014, the ACOG USA, the committee saying that the vaginal re rejuvenation is not a medical term, right? is offered by some practitioner. This is not medically indicated. The safety and the effectiveness of this procedure have not been documented. So in some uh, plastic surgeons society suggest that the word vaginal re rejuvenation should not be used as a medical terminology. He suggests to use the word uh, medical term like vaginoplasty or vaginal tightening instead. So, for the vaginal rejuvenation for general population or some practitioner that offer this word. It means in medical term, it's mean to do the vaginoplasty or vaginal tightening. Why it's become popular right now because of the changing in socio-cultural norms and women may have the problem with, with marriage, with marital problem. So they thought that after the surgery or the treatment of the vagina, make it tightening, the sex will be improved. The effect from the television and media. The effect from the website because e the women easy to get accessibility to the pornography or even the search engine, uh, some search engine direct the searcher to the center of cosmetic to, for that the cost so that the women can, they can trap the more women for the cosmetic surgery. This is 
as I mentioned before, in the past, we want to hide our body, right? But right now, every woman want to show their body. This is effect from the printed media. Most of the printed media that shows want the women to show their body. For the internet media, it's the same, right? Women want to show their body to the others to attack uh, the other people. Even the movie star like Debbie Moore, right? She got, she looked old before, but after the plastic surgery, she become young again. And some cosmetic, sur sur uh, cosmetic surgery or even the beauty, uh, beauty center, they use this picture showing that after before surgery, the vagina become white, but after surgery, it becomes small. Even in Malaysia, you see that. This is, I got some data interesting from Malaysia, your country. They have increased of the vagina, the laser vagina rejuvenation about 190% in two, from 2000, 2015 to 2016. And the cost for one treatment is about 2,500 Malaysian linkage. And even in Malaysia, uh, they have a, a lot of promotion for the laser rejuvenation. This is the example of the promotion by the internet. internet. Because of the women, right now the women live longer. I think it's a said in Malaysia, in Thailand, all over Asia, because of the good, the good of the health treatment, healthcare treatment. So the women live longer. And some women have money and they want uh, to pay to, to make their body become younger, even for the vagina. So today I'm going to talk about the update information about the vaginoplasty, vaginal tightening, that means the, or overall the vaginal rejuvenation. For the vaginoplasty, it's a plastic sur surgery of the vaginal opening or the vaginal canal and vaginal epithelium. This is frequently performed with a procedure that treatment for the prolapse. Right now, I think everybody, every OBGYN knows that for the vaginoplasty, they include the anterior corporaphy or anterior repair and, in, and posterior repair, but you can call high posterior repair. This is the picture of AP repair that everybody knows to make the vaginal outlet become smaller. You can include a small suggestion to the lateral corporaphy instead of doing the midline incision, you can use the lateral incision to avoid the scar in the midline that can cause the dyspareunia. And also for the corporaphy, they have a, uh, they have a guide, guideline that we could, should avoid the plication of levator and nine because when you do the plication of levator and nine, you can, that can cause significant dyspareunia. For the vaginoplasty, this is the picture that shows internet. One, you do the partial pasty, the vagina becomes smaller. Right, this is the picture. Okay. You can combine the sling operation. You can see small incision. This is sling surgery. For the vaginal rejuvenation, for the evidence by the surgery, they have a report of the evidence. They have a big review in 2006 by Dr. Sunu Lukta. They found that vaginal overage, uh, vaginal vaginoplasty for uh, for vaginal surgery for the female sexual dysfunction. There's a, after a, after vaginoplasty, all the anatomical all the have a high success rate for anatomical kill. Mean, it means that you can restore the vagina to normal anatomy, but you have to be aware that they can cause this preunia in the rate about six to thirty percent. They have a study from uh, Dr. Pardo in 2000 and 2006. They have report this uh, Dr. Pardo they select the course the, the case of only the women with vaginal laxity and require the vaginoplasty for vaginal tightening. They found that most of the women have improved of have a experience 94 percent experience a tight vagina and almost 74 percent is happy with, with the expectation. Another study for the Goodman, they report about a, a series of 47 women doing the vaginoplasty, and they found that the improvement of a sexual function after surgery. 
Dr. Moore in 2014 is the first report of using the PISQ. Mostly in the past, they're using FSFI, but PISQ is a question that decide to check for the sexual function after the prolapse surgery. Okay, they found that the women with vaginoplasty that treat for the vaginal laxity have the improvement of the PISQ sexual score. But anyhow, they found that they have the pain, the pain with intercourse may be, cons but may be persist after surgery. Another report from Dr. Abedi from Iran in 2014. This is, uh, he do the vaginoplasty for 86 women. And they found that after the surgery, most, most women have a better FSFI, female sexual index score after surgery. But he also report about 50%, 46% of women have this preunia at the six month follow up. So we have to be aware that even you got a tighter vagina, but some women can got the problem of this preunia. So in overall vaginal rejuvenation by surgery, you have evidence that they can improve the vaginal uh, anatomy and the sexual function. How about the laser? The laser is a light that amplified by the stimulate emission of the radiation. It's a light with power. The laser can cause, have the thermal effect and can cause coagulation, vaporization, carbonization, and hypertemia to the tissue. Once the tissue uh, has been destroyed, the laser can stimulate the production of heat shock protein and the good surrounding tissue can be produce the beta growth factor and the beta growth factor will stimulate the fibrotinic process and produce the collagen and extracellular matrix to, to heal the, the effect tissue. Usually for the laser, the, uh, the most common use media, medium is the carbon dioxide and the urban yak. Carbon dioxide seems to be the most, uh, the most common use right now and the urban yak is the second one coming up. The, the, the carbon dioxide laser have a good things that they can have a good hemostasis and prolong neocollagenosis. But the urban yak have less thermal diffusion and less tissue necrosis and have rapid heal. So right now it depends on what do you want to use. If you want to have high power, CO2 is better in this point. This is a picture of microscopic structure before and after treatment by the CO2 vaginal laser. This is a vaginal epithelium that become before the surgery, before the laser is atrophic. But after the laser, you see that the papilla become grow thicker. Uh, in case that somebody didn't see the, the vaginal rejuvenation laser before, let me show my video clip with, this is my video clip for my, for my uh, study of CO2 laser, vaginal laser for the treatment of vaginal atrophy. You see that usually this is a vaginal probe. I'm using right now is a, a fractional carbon dioxide laser. Once you insert the probe and you hit the power button, the laser beam will spread in, in the 360 degree in the vagina. And then you move the vaginal probe about 0 0.5 centimeters until it reaches the outlet. So it takes about this, this uh, vaginal laser, it takes about only two to three minutes and no need for anesthesia. The women can go back home at the same day. The pain is really minimum. Okay. That's why the laser become popular because of uh, a lot of physicians can use it at the, as our patient. Okay. I will go back to the slide. Okay. After once you use a fractional CO2, you will see that the laser beam will destroy the vaginal epithelium in a small dot area. So the good surrounding tissue will produce the beta growth factors to heal the, uh, the necrosis area. 
Mostly in the, in the first series of the vaginal laser is reported in the treatment of vaginal atrophy by Dr. Sawatole in the 2014. He found that once you use the fractional CO2 laser once a month for three months, the effect is stay about six months to one year. So the effect, they found that for the vaginal atrophy after the treatment in 12 week follow up, all the vaginal atrophy symptom improve in the women with and FVHI, vaginal health index improve at 12 months, at 12 weeks. And also he report another uh, paper about the improvement of sexual function by the FSFI at 12 weeks after the CO2 laser. This is the, the result of the FFFI, almost all domains getting better. Dr. Perino report in 2015, almost similar uh, result by using the fractional CO2 laser, the same. Improve of the vaginal, vaginal symptom in vaginal atrophy. Dr. Gambacciani in 2015, his report, the first report, vaginal erbium yak, erbium yak laser in the vagina. He compared with the vaginal S3 all group. He found that erbium uh, yak laser have improved the vag vag vaginal, vaginal symptom in vaginal atrophy symptom, similar to vaginal estrogen. He also report in 2018, the first report of long-term effect of vaginal erbium yak at two years or 24 months, say that erbium yak can improve vaginal atrophy at two years. Dr. Pedelli is also report of using, he's the first one who report the long-term of vaginal CO2 laser at two years of the vaginal CO2 laser in women with vaginal atrophy. Dr. Cruz is the first one to compare the CO2 laser with topical s 3 r but this paper is quite confusing. He compared only vaginal laser alone and vaginal laser with s 3 r He found that both can improve the vaginal atrophy, but if you use combination, the, the improvement will be better. The other study by Dr. Mott, Mottes in 2018, he, the first report of using the ABM yak laser in a breast cancer survivor, women with breast cancer, usually in women with breast cancer, they have to take loloxifene, right? To treat, to prevent the breast cancer recurrent. And loloxifene can cause vaginal atrophy symptom. So the treatment by hormone is impossible, right? So vaginal laser may be a good choice in this group of women. He report that, he report in about six months after the uh, erbium yak that improve, can improve the vaginal atrophy symptom in breast cancer survivor. Dr. Motes also report another results of yak laser in the treatment of vaginal atrophy. Similar result at six weeks, improvement of the VHI and uh, vaginal vulva atrophy symptom. Uh, I and Dr. Purim, my young, my young staff at my unit, at my division, just report as in this year in the menopause journal. My study, I'm doing the randomized control trial is a double blind CHAM control of using the vaginal CO2 laser in the treatment of vaginal atrophy women. So we randomized about 88 women to receive the laser CO2 vaginal laser. And in, in another group, half of them receive only, we put the vaginal probe, but didn't hit the power. So no vaginal, or you can say CHAM control trial. And we found that in a women that received the vaginal laser, they have improvement in vaginal atrophy symptom and vaginal health index at 12 weeks. But my study is all is, is, is a short duration. And our study is the first randomized control trial that compare CHAM and the laser for the treatment of vaginal atrophy. Another interesting is instead of using the vaginal laser normal, they just use a simple normal CO2 laser that using the cutting thing, but they used to focalate the burning or the vaginal mucosa to cause vaginal luge. And this Dr. Ostensky thought that once you increase the luge, you can improve, you can improve the feeling of penile stroke of during coitus. Okay. Right now, there is no comparison between the erbium yak and CO2 laser, which one is better? We are waiting for the result from Dr. Linda Cordoso from uh, King, King Health College, uh, from King Health Hospital in, in London. 
she doing the research comparing the C2 laser and the YAC laser for the treatment of vaginal uh, atrophy in uh, menopause women. I think the result will be coming up soon. Not only for the vaginal uh, for the laser, but there are some company and some physicians try to use radio frequency, like RF machine that we use for uh, tightening the face, right, the skin to use in the vagina. This is the vaginal probe that they use for RF. But there is, they have only few reports coming up right now. The first report is for treatment the orgasmic dysfunction. Only two report about the vaginal laxity. The first one is by Dr. Miheiser. They report in 24 women for the treatment of vaginal laxity and they found that the women have a significant tightening. The second one from the Sikuchi from Japan, he found that he used the uh, RF in 30 premenopausal women and they found that at six months, the women have a better sexual function after surgery, so only to study. Uh, and right now you have to be aware that laser is not without complication. They have a report of the series of complications by vaginal laser. The first one is vaginal stenosis. The second one is persistent dyspareunia. The third one is they found a fibrous band in the mid vagina and the women have the problem of dyspareunia. And the fourth one is the women have a persistent dyspareunia and with the insertional pain when the when her husband have the sexual coitus, she got the pain. So you have to be aware that they have a report of vaginal complication, even if it is a small paper, small number, but it's possible to have complication with vaginal laser. So for vaginal laser, they have a pro and cons for using the laser for the vaginoplasty or rejuvenation. The pro is that it's less, have a small complication report, less bleeding, more rapid healing times, and less recovery time. And you can treat the patient as our patient. But the, con the controversy is that I was a small study at evidence for the long term. They have only the short term follow up. They have a report of complication like scar burning this pre -junior. And the problem is the cost of the machine when compared to the medical treatment like a topical estrogen. So for the laser, for the evidence, it's still controversy. But not only the laser and RF, but now right now, they have some uh, physicians try to do something else. For example, they have a report, one a case, series, case report of do, do, using the fat lipofilling and injection of plasma rich, paspated rich plasma and filler hyaluronic acid in the vagina. But this is just a case report. Or the second one, he's, he used Dr. Park, he used, he tried to use the uh, micro, uh, micro mesh, gog, micro mesh is like a small mesh, a small thread, or even a small thread to put in the vagina to make it tightening. But he used only in 50 women and only one report. And he also reported a four year experience from, the, from, 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 from his uh, series. Okay, so that's one, one, only one report. So I have a concern, raised concern about the problem of lack of data or the safety in the long term safety. The problem of the cost of the treatment, the personal, most of the paper maybe they have a problem of with the personal conflict of interest. Some paper is supported by the machine, like a laser company machine. There's no, mostly the doctor didn't declare about the uh, transparency or accuracy of the study design. The other one is that some doctor mentioned that watching the rejuvenation maybe it's not a cosmetic because it's not improved appearance and enhance the self confidence. So maybe we cannot use it as a cosmetic surgery. So ACOG, as I mentioned before, they give this guideline that vaginal rejuvenation is not the medically indicated. The safety and effectiveness has not been documented. Ayuka give the statement that we, we need a lot of robust clinical trial to prove for the safety and to select idea candidate for the, this treatment. New Zealand give the, just to this last year, New Zealand uh, society keep saying that vaginal rejuvenation have little high quality evidence, have risk of potential complication, and 
this college, so the New Zealand Society, this college for the laser or any surgery that about the, the for the rejuvenation. For the US FDA, uh, in 2018, you give a warning that they have a lot of deceptive claim means that uh, false message or advertisement in the in the website and have a significant list related to this vaginal rejuvenation. Just only warning by FDA right now. So what are you guys and ICS right do right now? The ICS report in 2019. So in they have firstly in January 2019 the report the expert opinion that there is no information about this. The there is no agreement. They have no guideline, and they conclude that. For the guideline, in they also make a conclusion and report in another in February 2019 to be a, con a consensus that laser is not recommended for routine treatment. They should keep it only for the research only, and they need uh, the arrangement arrangement for clinical governance, consent, and audit for this one. This year, 2020. European Society of Sexual Medicine just pronounced the uh, statement, the guideline, the consensus about the laser-based evidence for laser rejuvenation. Almost similar that it's too early to conclude that the laser rejuvenation have evidence and should be treated. Because of lack of definition, accepted definition, lack of standard criteria for diagnosis and grading of the uh, severity of the women. They have no, uh, only there's no validated questionnaire for the, for the good patient reported outcome to measure in the study. And because of the study, most study are heterogeneity and the quality of the study that report right now is very really poor. Only a small case silly or scape report. So because of the data of a scare and heterogeneous and make it difficult to make a conclusion. So it, uh, European society didn't suggest to use laser rejuvenation as a treatment. Also the same with the RF, with the radio frequency. The European society of uh, sex, sexual medicine just also report that RF is not suitable for the treatment right now. How about the Can Canadian Society of OBGYN? They're just coming up. The Canadian recommendation in 2018 that the patient you can, you can consider for short-term relief of the vaginal, vaginal atrophy by the laser. But there is no evidence for the, to repress, to use the laser to repress the local estrogen. So local estrogen should be the choice. And there is no evidence for the treatment of the straight continence by the laser. And the fourth one is that there's no long-term result for the treatment of the vaginal laser for the vaginal atrophy or even the straight continence. And we should not use the laser. So what you may ask me, what is the situation in Thailand right now? In Thailand, the situation may be different from the other countries in Asia. Uh, the laser machine is approved by the Thai FDA as a machine because of the machine is approved to use in human. But because of the machine, our Thai medical, Thai FDA do not have the strict indication for the machine. So it's the uh, is a, it depends on the society or OBGYN society to give the guideline and recommendation. Right now, our society, five years ago, our society, RTCOG, Royal Thai College of OBGYN, just give, just only announce the warning. And we are, right now, we are waiting to see the recommendation from the, uh, the authority like ICS, IUCA, or from around the world. What is their ex, uh, what the opinion and guideline that should be come out right now? So right now, for our college of UJBN, we still wait and see. Right now, there is no lawsuit case of vaginal laser, but there is some report of some 
minor complication after laser treatment. So for the take home message, right now they have a problem with the medical terminology for vaginal rejuvenation. They have some evidence that vaginal laser may improve vaginal autophy and sexual function in short term, but not in the long term. The evidence, they have evidence of complication of laser. We should accept new technique with cautions. I think many organizations is on going process to give the recommendation. I think uh, it's our duty of as a professional organization to review and give the guideline for our uh, OB society in the future. I think it's our duty for like Malaysia, Thailand, or even Asia to help and to talk and to see and we learn from each other, which should be the good guideline for the vaginal laser in the future. As because this one is becoming more popular in the near future. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Savit. I appreciate the enthusiasm. That was quite obvious in the way you delivered the lecture. Illustrations were great as you brought Hello, us can through. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Savit. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that lecture. So it was very illustrative and you summarized the evidence very well. There are a couple of questions, but we might keep them until the case discussions at the end, if you don't mind. Yes. So thank you very much. So next, I would like to invite Dr. Roy Ng to, so we're going to move from lasers, uh, newish technology to something that is our bread and butter. And Dr. Roy is going to enlighten us about how to approach a patient with prolapse and urinary incontinence. Dr. Roy, yeah. is yours? Yeah. Okay. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, our chairperson, Dr. Tan Gek Im, for her kind words. And obviously, Dr. Hui Mei Ling, OGSM Experts Series Webinar Coordinator, OGSM President elect 2020 2021, and the organizing committee, OGSM Secretary, especially Prema and, and Clarence, and all the participants for spending the afternoon with us. Um, when I was asked to do this topic, um, Actually, it looks simple, but it took me a lot of thought and effort because it literally covers all of your gynecology. So I hope I've done justice to this topic. So let's get on. So the agenda will be covering on prolapse definition, normal anatomy versus uh, polyorgan prolapse symptoms, pathophysiology of polyorgan prolapse algorithm, management of POP, conservative and surgical, Surgery for um, POP algorithms or elongated cervix, bit of it up, uterine prolapse, significant pelvic organ prolapse, and vaginal wall prolapse. And I'll touch on the urinary incontinence, stress, urge, mixed overflow, and conclusions. But I'll try and tie the two of them together um, POP and stress and uh, urinary incontinence. Okay, so I start with prolapse. The definition of prolapse is from Latin word meaning to fall. Older terminologies for prolapse includes uterine vagina prolapse, UVP. This is still being used by the ICD-10 for coding purposes. Previously, it was uh, known as urogenital or even genital prolapse. The current terminology is called pelvic organ prolapse, POP or POP. It's a medical term used to describe coming down or sagging of the uterus or vagina wall at the back. It's called apical uh, prolapse or apex. Vagina now is divided into anterior wall or cystocele before. We no longer talk about urethral seal. The posterior wall, mainly rectal seal. Um, clinically, it's difficult to actually differentiate uh, rectal seal from anterior seal unless you can see peristalsis or small bowels within the anterior seal sac. This is a very good um, diagram from Ayuga. So the website is www yourpelvicfloor.org, there are 50, about 40 leaflets, all free of charge. So diagrams like that are very good. For example, here in the middle, normal anatomy, no prolapse. You can see the pubic bone, the sacrum and coccyx, bladder, urethra, uterus, vagina, in a supported by the pubic floor, the pubic oxygen muscle here. There's no prolapse. Here you can see that the bladder has prolapsed 
into the vagina and out of the vagina. So you can see a urethra is king. So this part of urine will not be able to be passed. So they cause other problems. I'll come to that later on. Similarly, on the back wall, you can see the rectum is prolapsed into the vagina and out. And again, the feces here will be trapped and will cause a difficulty in defecating and constipation. You can see the anus is here. And you can get uterus vagina prolapse, uterus, uh, bladder, and rectum early stages, it can get worse and worse. Eventually, can have a complete erosion of vagina or presidential. Okay, so what are the symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse? The common symptom is something coming down or lump below. Discomfort, pressure, pain, backache is a query because the not really recognized for the patient attribute prolapse to backache. There are other causes of backache which are more um, more likely rather than prolapse. So when the lump is outside, you can understand it's difficult to sit, to stand, to walk, difficult to intercourse, and even not, not able to intercourse. And some may complain of vaginal looseness and laxity. We are more important about O-active bladder, OAB, symptoms of urgency, without, without urge incontinence, daytime frequency, nocturia, urinary incontinence, including urge, stress, and mix, and voiding difficulties causing um, UTI, recurrent UTI, causing always tension, overflow, incontinence, like you saw just now on the diagram. And constipation, you also saw that rectal seal. And vagina discharge and bleeding when the prolapse is outside, rubbing onto clothes. Cervix is also everted with acropion. And women always are fearful of growth or cancer, the lump outside. And they have anxiety, shame, and depression because they feel that body image is altered, that they're different now. So this is a very important site. Pathophysiology of POP causing UTI, OAB, any type of incontinence, uh, void, uh, sorry, voiding difficulty, as well as urosepsis. So mild to moderate POP, like stage one or two, pelvic organ prolapse, may be no asymptomatic or mild symptoms, or may cause SUI. Coming to severe or significant POP, I'll come show you the next slide, easier to see in, in, a, in a table form. So this is my own um, preparation algorithm for pathophysiology of significant POP more than stage three or prostitution. So in significant POP or prostitution, outlet obstruction causing urethral kinking, like you can see here, urethral kinking by the sister seal, causing voiding difficulty, incomplete emptying, restal urine recurrent UTI. So how do you cure your recurrent UTI? You just can't keep giving antibiotics when you're not treating the cause. So this can be treated later, Dr. Kong will show us by pastry. If the patient refuses to use the pastry, you must show them this diagram and tell them that they use a finger to push the bladder in when they're passing urine. Many women are reluctant to do this because they think that putting a finger in the vagina will cause infection, but they must be reassured the vagina is not sterile, germs goes in and out into the vagina. So similarly, when they have urethral kinking, they have a detrusor hypertrophy, and this will eventually have detrusor O activity and causing uh, OAB, O-active bladder, dry, which means no urgent incontinence, or wet with urgent incontinence. It's very similar to benign prostatic hypertrophic in men. Because of that and large prostate, men OAB symptoms, and eventually, similarly, eventually the bladder may fail in a significant prolapse or in BPH, where detrusor is unactive, there's failure, or extension, overflow incontinence. We don't want to reach this stage because by that stage, Treatment may be only cosmetic, you're not able to cure the function. And you must also remember that something called occult or concealed SUI because the prolapse is outside, there's widening difficulty. Similarly, when a patient coughs, there's no leakage because the urethra is king. So after operation, patient may develop stress incontinence. Lastly, you said gun prolapse like that, the bladder is outside. Not only the urethra is king, the ureters are also king, causing hydrator, hydronephrosis. Race re-rape, urea, race scattering, chronic renal disease, eventual renal failure, and pit infection, you have backflow, you have bacteremia, septicemia, urosepsis, and even death. So prolapse can cause death if the prolapse is significant and severe. So all these are not aware, patients are not aware, and you don't want all this to happen. Later I'll show you these things can happen in life. So what's the benefit of treating pelvic organ prolapse? When you treat pelvic organ prolapse, better with a pastry or surgery, you actually treat the direct symptoms and signs of pelvic organ prolapse. But there's additional bonus of treating the following, which are caused by POP, as we showed just now. So we're also treating stress and incontinence, whether it's revealed or concealed. We are treating UTI, recurrent UTI. We are treating OAB dry and wet. We're treating mixed incontinence, USI and UUI. We're treating overflow, 
in conference, we can prevent chronic renal disease or failure and prevent better failure before it's too late. But you must understand that when we treat POP with significant prolapse, we may cause occult or concealed SUI or USI. The patient may not have this before surgery. If after surgery, the prolapse is cured, but still have stress in conscience because you have relieved the king king. So this must be made aware and patient should understand that this can happen. So if they perform urine dynamics with and without ring pastry before surgery, and if this is diagnosed to offer surgery for um, SUI together with the prolapse, must be aware that patients with prolapse have difficulty widening, so they tend to strain to void. And when they strain to void, then can be a problem because after surgery, let's say they have stress incontinence, they perform a tip operation, then they strain to the white. When they strain to the white, it's like coughing, the, the urethra is blocked by the tip when they strain to the white, and then they have voiding difficulty, ARU, you think your tape is too tight, you then tell her that you must loosen the tape, cut the tape, excise the tape. When you do that, in fact, stress as you are in 26%, you're treating the wrong pathology. So it's important to understand why patients have have uh, this sort of problem with balsamic widening, and this can be shown on neurodynamics on widening systematry. Now, when you want to operate, you must know why you want to operate, when you want to operate, and how you want to operate. So all these factors are important. You must know how severe are the symptoms and the signs. Usually, the symptoms and signs are directly proportional to size and severity of the pelvic organ prolapse, and how the prolapse can cause affect the quality of life, and how old the patient. If she's young, is she post-menopause? Has she had children before? Is she married? Is she sexually active? Is she menopause now? All these are important to decide what operation you want to do. Is she mentally fit to give consent? Is she physically fit to undergo the anesthesia and the surgery? Has she got comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, previous stroke, previous DVT, pulmonary embolism, issue of blood thinness? All this must be taken into consideration. And she got other urinary and bowel symptoms, like, uh, as we mentioned, all types of incontinence and bowel problems. And what about conservative and surgical? The Kong will tell you about conservative, I'll concentrate on surgical treatment. What are the complications of both of these step treatments? What are the patients and families wishes? What do they want out of this surgery? What do they want for their prolapse? And what are the myths is very important. And Dr. Google is the biggest headache. They'll tell you everything about Dr. Google. Many of them have no evidence as shown by Dr. Sumit just now. So much from in Google, but very little in PubMed. And the cost is also important. The cost of a simple surgery, robotic surgery is a big difference. And gynecologist preference, is this gynecologist only wants to do laparoscopic and robotic or someone wants to do only vaginal? So what's the threshold and comfort level of treatment? Can the person, uh, can the surgeon do a um, sacrocopopexy or a sacrospinal ligament fixation? He or she cannot. How willing is a urogynecologist gynecologist willing to seek help, advice, and to refer the patient out for the good of the patient? So all these factors must be taken into consideration for any decision regarding surgery. Next thing, we come to simple management of POP. So conservative is Kegels exercises or topical estrogens. This may be good for early stages, maybe stage one, stage two. Phase three, also good for um, stage two, stage one, no need stage two. Stage three, maybe gel horn, I'll show you. Then surgery can be conventional, can be vaginal, abdominal, laparoscopic, robotic for significant POP or prostitutia, or there's wall prolapse, or vaginal measures. All this can be, can be used different options depending on the patient. How to decide now? You can see, I'll just talk very quickly on, on the pastry. So I will, I will not talk too much because um, Dr. Kong will be telling us. So pastry, not just ring pastry, large varieties of pastries with different types of pop and SUI, usually made of latex, PVC and silicone, indication for the elderly, medically unfit, not keen for surgery. If it's too big, it's painful, too small, you'll fall out. Complications uh, vagina discharge because it's a foreign body, so you get um, colonization by microbiome. Any abrasion, ulceration gets infected by grand bacteria in the vagina, causing a bleeding, foul smelling discharge. And remember, occult SUI we mentioned just now because of the kinking effect of the urethra. So, do you every time a patient comes, do you put a new pastry? I used to do that, but I stopped many, many years ago because there's no need to give a new pastry because it is expensive. You're going to pollute the environment. These are all non-biodegradable. And the vagina is not sterile anyway. It always colonized with bacteria and microbiome. So you just have to wash and reinsert. And the pastry can last many years as long as it is soft 
pliable and not hard, you can use it. Change it three to four monthly, then three to six monthly, very variable, but I do it about four, three to four monthly. Some pastries like Jahon make it difficult to intercourse, so you must think of that. Patient is sexually active, you cannot use certain pastries. So as you can see here, as you said, normal, UEP, a ring pastry fits very well in a grade two pelvic organ prolapse. So I'm just going to this question, think about it. 60 year old para two is stage two POP, which means that the uh, uterus is uh, between minus one to plus one inside, outside the hymen, and anterior vaginal wall prolapse. OEP is dry, frequency, uh, nocturne and urgency. Sexually active, very rarely, once a month. Opted for ring pastry, we inserted the 68 mm. So the pastries are from 50 to 83 mm difference, up to 80 to 105 mm. And use primary cream at entrance of the vagina and Magifem 100 both twice a week because this will um, prevent uh, um, thickening of the vagina, as you showed just now. Dr. Sewick has shown using laser, simply estrogen will cause the vagina to back to grow back to normal and then to reduce the risk of abrasion, ulceration, infection, and bleeding. A month later, the patient called up for urgent appointment because she developed stress incontinence when she had flu and URTI. She was very upset. She says, the ring now has cured my prolapse. It caused me to have incontinence. I want it to be removed. So you all think about what's the diagnosis? How will you explain your diagnosis? What will be your next step in your management, investigations, and treatment options? How to cure original um, symptom and signs and how to cure her uh, current new symptoms and signs. Okay, all these types of pastries, you see, a big product like that, a ring pastry will not stay. This the patient was treated with packing, and uh, one fine day, because it was so edematous, every time we pack, small stones came out. One fine day, she came up, we brought this one big pack of stones, 140 grams. I, I actually put it all out. She actually passed all these stones and picked all this up in the toilet and brought it back. And eventually, because no more stones left, we put in a, a gel horn pastry. She's waiting for surgery, having a UTI now. Yeah, so this is significant POP. So all these surgeries, you can see anterior repair, posterior repair, Manchester, vagina hysterectomy with VSO, the cause had a plastic to prevent what prolapse and surgery to prevent what prolapse or for what prolapse. Maybe abdominal, laparoscopic, robotic, cyclopexy, vaginal, cyclospinal ligament, fixation, copopexy, hydropexy, psychopexy, copoclysis, mesh. How to choose what operation? The next few slides I'll show you how to choose which operation. These are algorithms which I've um, um, produced myself. Algorithm for long headed cervix with minimal prolapse and with long headed uterine prolapse. If someone with long headed cervix with minimal or no uterine prolapse, Manchester particle operation can be done. You can look at the Ayuga Academy. I have a video there if you're a member of Ayuga. If you've got long headed cervix with uterine prolapse, the patient wishes to preserve the uterus can perform a Manchester repair and a sacral spine ligament fixation to the cervical stump. If she wishes to have the remove, the uterus removed, can perform a giant hysterectomy, may cause cardioplasty, prevent more prolapse. After that, if the vault is still low, say stage two or three, you can add a sacral spine ligament fixation to the vaginal wall and anterior procedure repair as indicated. And if any incontinence is proven on your done mix, you can add a mid ritual tape because everything is done vaginally. You don't do something abdominally or vaginal surgery. Next is somebody with significant pelvic organ prolapse, stage three pelvic organ prolapse, who wishes to preserve the uterus, don't want the uterus removed. If she's elderly, frail comorbidities, not sexually active, then you can perform a partial or default copiasis and a perineurophy. If she's older, fit but sexually active, can perform a sacral spine ligament fixation to the cervix and a posterior and a pelvic floor repair. If you're younger, fit, and sexually active, you can either perform abdominal, laparoscopic, robotic, sacro, uh, sacrocopopexy to the uterus or cervix, and parvagine defect repair the lateral prolapse, and a pelvic floor repair from below if there's anterior posterior repair. If she does not wish to preserve the uterus, you can perform vagina hysterectomy, the cardioplasty, sacral spine ligament fixation, jawad, and pelvic floor repair. So coming to the next one is that similarly, if any incontinence, you can perform either a mutual tape or corporal suspension, depending on what route you have, you have used. Lastly, in someone with vaginal wall prolapse, uterus has been removed, now has a wall prolapse, which is elderly, 
failed comorbidities, not sexually active, can perform a complete hypoglycosis with therapy. If she's older, fit and sexually active, can perform six months fixation to which I walk and very far repair as required. If she's younger, fit, sexually active, can perform as I mentioned earlier, abdominal, laparoscopic, robotic, cyclocopexic, Progen defect for the uh, lateral defects and very floor repair, which I need if necessary. And also add your incontinence surgery if she has either overt or curl SUI. So, very quickly on symptoms of urinary incontinence. So, urinary incontinence, I'll start with stress. Urinary incontinence, as defined by the ICS, is the complaint of any monetary leakage of urine. The types of urinary incontinence are active bladder, wet. OAB with urge incontinence, stress incontinence including occult or concealed, mixed incontinence of the two of them, overflow incontinence, true incontinence is mainly due to fistula, uh, due to isogenic or born double ureters, for example. I'm going to touch on that. So the ICS defines stress during incontinence, SUI as so SUI is a complaint for the sign, as a complaint of involuntary leakage during on effort, on exertion, on coughing, or sneezing. USI, urodynamic stress incontinence, is proven on urodynamics. There's a difference between SUI and USI. Okay, I'll show you this, uh, for, uh, this SUI first. Courtesy of my friend, Lee Li Chang. Look at it. Severe stress incontinence. See how bad it is. Each time you call, she licks, and your face may be showered by her if you're not aware of that. Yeah. Next, urodynamics here is vesicle pressure. Abdominal pressure, per cycle minus abdominal, detrusive pressure. You can see during filling, the bladder is stable. Even here, we're very stable. When she's coughing, she 10 coughs, she licked 45.5 grams because special gravity of urine and saline is one. So one gram is one mil. So this patient had urine stress incontinence, this, uh, this uh, detrusive contraction, flow rate, volume void. 373 went in. She licked 45, so about 400, she passed out 300. So urodynamic stress in involuntary leakage of urine during raised intravesical pressure, secondary to raised abdominal pressure, but in the absence of detrusive contraction. So everything is not due to the bladder contracting, but because the pelvic floor is weak to prevent leakage. So this one is USI, so surgery is actually indicated in such cases. So treatment of SUI, very quickly, weight loss of obese patients, very diet exercise, treat the constipation, chronic cough, or white, stop smoking, pelvic floor exercises or kegels. Neck is something a lot of people are not aware. The pelvic floor is skeletal muscle. It used to contract reflexly, but this reflex action is lost because of childbirth, damage to put the nerve along the birth canal, Elkoff canal during childbirth. So this transmission of the nerve along the put nerve is delayed. So the patient need to contract the pelvic floor before she coughs or sneezes. Otherwise, the pelvic floor alone will not contract on its own. So it's something called neck. But if the patient lives on jogging, it's difficult to contract the pelvic floor every time she jogs. So surgery may be indicated for young patients who live on jogging, otherwise can put some sort of pastry that can block the urethra when they cough or surgery. What are types of surgery? So just to tell you that obesity is a known cause of urine incontinence and weight loss decreases in continent of these patients, whether in mild or moderate of this. And pelvic floor muscle training is also important for SUI, UUI, MUI. The pelvic floor is actually first-line treatment in all these patients. Okay? An operation, just to cut it short, can go retrocubic, Bottom up, top down, transoperator, outside in, inside out, single incision, many things. This is a conventional TVT, bottom up. Complication in bladder perforation can be quite high, usually 5%. Large vessel perforation, very rare. Nerve, intestinal, very, very rare. Transoperator can be outside in or inside out, and complications also are rare for bladder and urethra. Wedding difficulties are the same, about 5% for both. So, which group of suspension, original but suspension, you can see here the sutures are tied very tightly, and high percentage of them have widening difficulty. Do a laparoscopic bush, you cannot tie tightly. You can see there's bow stringing, and here you can see there's a bow stringing here, and not urethra, not glue, widening difficulty, urge content very, very low. So, when doing a bush, mustn't tie too tightly, otherwise, you have the same problems of widening difficulty and detrusive activity as well. So, this is a diagram showing you a normal patient with 
raise intraabdominal pressure. There's no leakage because the bland neck is closed. In someone with hypermobility, you can see the stretching ring content, bland neck open. Someone with a large sister seal, but in the vagina, outside the vagina, when she coughs, the bladder comes down, the urethra is king, there's no leakage. When you reduce this by your surgery, the urethra is no longer king and she develops stress incontinence, now we call occult or now revealed, it was concealed before, yeah? So 13 to 65 percent of concerned women develop symptoms of SUI after surgical correction of prolapse. Retrospective study of women who underwent complexes, small study, 8 out of 30, 27 percent develop stress after surgery. Now coming to OAB, OAB is a clinical syndrome, not a urodynamic diagnosis, comprises of urgency, urgent incontinence, usually frequency and nocturia in the absence of pathologic or metabolic conditions. Show you here, eight times or more is abnormal, two times or more than seven times is abnormal, more than one is abnormal. Urgency, urgent incontinence, OAB. So here you can see on your dynamics, the pressure in the bladder, pressure in the abdomen, this minority is pressure. There's rise of pressure and this urge in concern. So this is your this is detrusal of activity. So detrusal of activity is one that should objectively to contract spontaneously on its own, or when a patient is standing in a coffin during a filling phase, when she's trying to inhibit maturation. You call it detrusal hyperreflexia if there's some neurological deficit. If not, you just call it detrusal activity. So Causes of OAB can be due to physiological, psychological, pharmacological, endocrinological, pathological. Long list of pathological, UTI, menopause, bladder stone, bladder cancer, irradiation, ketamine, chronic cystitis, interstitial cystitis, cardiac failure will cause nocturia, pelvic masses will compress in the bladder, POP, also we mentioned earlier on, digital activity, bladder contracts, stress incontinence will go more often, that's why you have this problem and can be a combination. So treatment of OAB, lifestyle modification, conservative pelvic floor bladder training, vaginal intrusions, medical antiquonics, antimuscarinics, trisexual antidepressant. The new kit on the block is beta-3 adrenergic agonist meribrigal. This relaxes the detrusor muscle during storage phase on the urinary bladder filling white cycle by activation of beta-3 adrenergic receptors, increasing the bladder capacity because of bladder relaxers. Okay, again, here we mentioned pelvic floor muscle training is important and uh, anti-muscarinic more important than uh, bladder training, and both of them is better than single treatment. And topical estrogens, you can see anti-muscarinic uh, management of post-menopause women. So uh, use of estrogen and anti-muscarinic is useful. Some show that topical estrogen may be as beneficial as oral and oral um, anti-muscarinic. I want to just touch on this because it's very important to know that with genital urinary syndrome of menopause GSM, you have vaginal dryness, vagina is very atrophic, anterior vestibule looks like it's prolapsed, but it's normal. With burning, discharge, dyspareunia, soreness, the urinary frequency, urgency, not sure, this is very similar to UTI. You also get recurrent UTI, and treatment is low dose vaginal estrogen because the vagina pH is now becomes alkaline in menopause, and then bacteria can enter the vagina. When you're pre-menopause, the vagina is acidic, it protects the vagina from colonized with gram-negative bacteria. So you can see why in a vagina, pre-menopause, just like the brand new tires, and after that, they're all bald, and see intercourse is painful. Similarly, the urethra, when you're pre-menopause, can close well, after menopause, cannot close well, just like a tap without a washer will leak. So this is pre-menopause, post-menopause, so topical nutrition is helpful for this. Just now, you've shown Dr. Sweet's slide, pre-menopause, you have not recognized stress-effect epithelium, lemna propria, muscularis. Five years after menopause, this layer is completely shut off. There's no more um, satisfied non epithelium. Nerves and blood vessels are here, very close to the surface, so very, very sensitive and causing symptoms of um, OAV symptoms and can cause cracks and tests, causing recurrent UTI as well. So topical estrogen, remembrance cream, and medifam can be used. And this is very, very safe. When it is absorbed, does it increase the blood sugar level? So does not cause any complication of the systemic um, estrogen replacement therapy. So, well, coming to the last two sites now, mixed incontinence, patient has detrusor contraction, detrusor activity and leakage, and here, bladder is stable, as you have some USI, so it's a combination. 
So what you want to do, you treat this medically first. And if this works, if you still have stress, you can treat that with surgery. So treat OAB, if it improves, you may treat the stress, but results are not so good because patient has also OAB. OAB needs to be treated postoperatively as well. All right. So on this last conclusion, the patient, what must you do? Here, you tell the patient you could overcome stress because of the kinking and treat with Otherwise, you don't do anything. She have, she have you put a patient in incontinence, so you must do a surgery for prolapse and incontinence to cure both the symptoms. Prenons of urinary incontinence in our own integrated women's health program called 1,200 healthy midlife Singaporean women on 50%, and 25% uh, of them have stress and mixed incontinence. And before menopause, SUI is more common. After menopause, urge incontinence is more common. And obesity also contributed to incontinence. POP may contribute to recurrent UTI, OAB, urinary incontinence, and voiding difficulty. And there's also balsama voiding and local SUI. So it's important to understand the pathophysiology of POP and manage this patient holistically. The vicious and medical and mental fitness of patients must be aware. The multiple conservative and surgical treatment options to tailor management of each individual patient rather than one size fits all. Cannot just do wet shift PFR for all patients, must combine the different operations we mentioned. My last slide, next. So, the 46th Ayuga annual hybrid meeting is on 8th of, to 11th of December uh, 2021. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Roy. Come. Yeah. So thank you very much for that very comprehensive lecture. Uh, we have given you the task to fit um, three quarters of a Eurogyne textbook into half an hour lecture, and I think you've lived up to it very well. So thank you for thank that. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rice. So um, without further ado, we will move on to Dr. Kong Su Yen. And we will... Dr. Kong, are you there? Um, yes, I am. Can you hear right. me? Yes, so uh, we are going back to basics. So Dr. Kong Su Yen will share with us about pessary versus surgery for uterine prolapse. Dr. Okay, Kong? thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Tan, Dr. Hu, for, and to the OGSM for your kind invitation. And I'd like to also thank Vaskaran and Clar um, Clarendon, uh, Clarence, who has been fantastic with the IT. So um, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I've been asked to speak about um, this topic, pessary versus surgery for prolapse. And it's certainly a question that all of us as gynecologists ask ourselves, you know, even on the, a weekly basis or a daily basis when we're doing clinic. Because why? It's because pelvic organ prolapse is uh, one of the most common gynecological conditions that we um, treat as gynecologists. Up to 50% of Paris women um, uh, have been reported to have POP, so it's as high as that. And out of these women, 11% of the female population would at some time in their lives undergo surgery for POP. But surgery itself is not curative. And it's been reported that up to 30% of these women would actually develop recurrence of prolapse within four years, requiring further surgery. So that itself is rather worrying. And of course, if anything, we'll probably be dealing with more and more of these uh, POP cases as we go on, because we are now dealing with an aging population. So with time, POP itself will present to us more and, and more uh, to our clinics. So how do we decide? Pestry or should we go for surgery? Well, I'm sure we, all, we have all come across many patients with asymptomatic prolapse when we do vagina examinations, when we do pap smears. But what is important to note is that asymptomatic prolapse do not necessarily need treatment. So really what we can do is to advise them to perhaps um, start doing Kegel exercise or pelvic floor exercises. And of course, to give them advice regarding um, you know, avoidance of risk factors that would precipitate um, worsening of their POP, such as you know, anything that increases their intra-abdominal pressure, you know, chronic constipation, a cough, 
heavy lifting, and of course, you know, it's becoming more and more of a problem, um, obesity, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, in fact, all our countries. So really what I'm going to talk about more uh, is the management of uh, symptomatic prolapse. So we're talking about uh, mostly prolapses of uh, stage three and four when they're actually out of the introitus. But of course, there are going to be some stage twos, which uh, would result in some symptoms for the patient. Now, we've got the patient and of course, we as surgeons, you know, what is it that run through our mind? What are the factors that make us decide pessary or surgery? Well, certainly the factors which the patient would consider in the decision making may well be very different from the doctors. So it's very important to explore um, the patient's concerns and of course to then ascertain, ascertain her preferences. And also of course, to ask ourselves, is their choice of treatment reasonable? And of course, it's also very important to explain to the patient and the families as to why we, as his or her doctor, will err her towards more towards pessary or surgery. So we have to actually explain to them our reasoning as well. So I'll start with vaginal pessaries. And we all know this. It is a safe, it's an effective treatment for um, pelvic organ prolapse. And it has been used successfully in many women. And the definition of successful use of pessary is really continuation of use. And we've got 56 to 89% of women actually still using pessaries at three months. And studies have also shown that you know, more prolonged use of up to a year, the more than half of them will actually still be using these pessaries. And we also all know that there are some women who would use pessaries till the end of their lives without any problems. Now, what about surgeons? Well, we've got two studies that have been quoted, um, um, studies done in uh, the UK and the US, asking gynecologists as to what they will offer mm -hmm. first as first line treatment for prolapse. And this is a very high number. You know, more than three quarters of these uh, surgeons would actually offer pessary as a first line treatment. And if you were then to ask the women, well, two thirds of them will actually choose pessary as a first line treatment. So although traditionally thoughts, uh, pessaries are thought of uh, treatment only for women deemed to be unfit for surgery, pessaries are indeed a viable treatment option for the majority of women as a first line treatment. So we, we should um, bear that in mind. So when is it would be, um, prefer um, to think about using PES3 for management? Well, certainly there's patient factors, especially if they will say elderly, but of course also to say that we shouldn't be ageist. Just because they're elderly, it doesn't mean that, that, that they're unfit for surgery. So we also have to bear that in mind. But of course, what is more important is to note their comorbidity. Do they have you know, um, serious uncontrolled diabetes, for example, or um, ischemic heart disease or valvular disease that would um, deem them unfit to have an anesthetic for surgery? Um, women who are not sexually active perhaps will err towards using pessaries, but of course, um, this will probably just apply to uh, uh, space occupying uh, pessaries. We can certainly still use uh, ring pessaries for women uh, if they were uh, still sexually active. So the type of surgery would matter in this, in, in, in this uh, uh, point. Um, pessaries are also preferred, especially um, in uh, women who um, say that they have not completed their families. And certainly if the women were to present with POP during pregnancy. What else? Well, certainly if the patient um, was awaiting surgery, I don't think we should deprive them of using a pessary to relieve them of their uh, POP symptoms. That certainly would be very helpful. Um, there are some patients, I'm sure all of us have come across who are particularly anxious, anxious about surgery, anxious about the anesthetic. And in these women, perhaps to avoid surgery, pessary will be the answer. There are also some patients who, for personal reasons or work circumstances, are unable to take the time off to have surgery and also to convalesce and take time off after surgery 
um, these will also be a group of women where they would perhaps prefer you to use the PES-3. And I think lastly, um, the cost of surgery um, in uh, certain patients are completely borne by the patients or the, and the family. So in this situation, it might be that they are unable to afford it. And of course, worldwide, we cannot ignore this COVID-19 problem. And certainly um, in, in, in the year 2020, it's certainly been a, a, a priority for, for all of us to be careful. Um, we are um, trying to avoid hospitalization, surgery, and anesthesia. Um, we are also restricting our traveling. There's also limited um, availability of blood products. And of course, um, there's also a diversion of medical services. And in this rather dire situation that all of us face, uh, it is uh, very useful to be able to defer or delay surgery with using the pestry in the meantime. Now, what about from the surgeon's perspective? When is it that I, as a surgeon, would prefer to use a pestry? Well, certainly, I think we mentioned this earlier, if they had a comor comorbidity um, where a, a general anesthetic or regional anesthetic was contraindicated. I think the other thing also that um, you know, we come across are women perhaps who are unable to lie supine. You know, women who have got severe kyphal scoliosis. This itself obviously will make positioning on the uh, operating theater uh, table difficult but also obviously be uh, a, a difficult uh, anesthetic candidate too, in terms of ventilation. Um, certainly for women who are awaiting surgery, as I mentioned earlier, PES-3 would be uh, fantastic in, uh, in terms of uh, offering, offering symptomatic relief. Um, this will be particularly useful uh, in, to reduce the uh, tissue edema and, uh, and also um, associated complications uh, with the uh, prolapse um, actually being um, protruding out. I'll talk about that later. What are the associated complications with an advanced pelvic organ prolapse that remains untreated? Um, what else? Well, certainly I think from the surgeon's perspective, uh, you should certainly think about using a PES-3, um, perhaps uh, in the cases of um, POP recurrence, especially when the risk factors for POP are persistent, such as morbid ob obesity, um, old age, um, patient having a chronic cough due to chronic bronchitis, or if the patient indeed has got very poor tissue quality on examination. Again, a very common reason as to when um, I would perhaps consider using a pessary would be if the surgery itself was deemed to be very complex, when she's had multiple repeat surgeries, perhaps um, actually resulting in uh, severe scarring of the uh, pelvic floor. And also, of course, if uh, she presented with um, advanced pelvic organ prolapse, and if you as a surgeon do not feel you could tackle such complex um, surgery, then it may be worthwhile putting a pessary in while uh, waiting to refer this uh, patient to um, your fellow urogynecologist. Because why is that? Well, certainly it's very important to do the best surgery for the, the patients. Um, doing a vaginal hysterectomy and a corporophy alone, for example, in this patient with uh, prosthodontia, will not work. And uh, you will be doing her a disservice by uh, not being able to offer her vault uh, suspension surgery at the same sitting. So basically, if you just did a vaginal hysterectomy repair, she will for sure be coming back to you not long postoperatively presenting with a significant vault prolapse. Okay, so when else? When else would I, as a surgeon, think about using a pessary? Would be if um, I had limited surgical access, if I thought the complications of surgery would be high if I was to attempt uh, further surgery. So for this patient, for example, she's got multiple abdominal scars and she's also got a stoma. So for sure, I will not be doing open or laparoscopic surgery in such a patient. 
But this also applies if you've got limited surgical access vaginally. And um, of course, you've got some elderly patients who've got uh, pelvic contractures or fixed deformity of their lower limbs where um, access to the vagina orifice would be difficult. And also, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, if women had had previous surgery, multiple surgeries uh, resulting in a severe scarring of the pelvic floor. Okay, so now moving on, when would it be um, that surgery would be preferable to using the PES3? Well, certainly I think if you're going to the other um, spectrum uh, of patients where, of course, if patients were physically fit, if they were young, um, if they were sexually active, and also more so if they had an advanced pelvic organ prolapse. So these are patients really that, um, you know, we would not want to subject them to um, uh, vaginal pessary that um, which they themselves could result in complications of uh, pessary use. I'll go on to that later. But of course, subjecting these patients to very regular, you know, regular follow-ups every four, every six months for the rest of their life. So certainly it would not be preferable in this situation to use a pessary. Um, and I think this is really quite obvious too. When, when else would surgery be preferable? Well, if the patient wants definitive treatment. Um, also, I think if they're unable to attend regular follow-ups for their pessary change and checks, especially say they live in rural areas or these patients have got, uh, got lack of transport to get them to the hospital on a regular basis, um, I think um, Professor Roy had mentioned this earlier, if um, pessaries go unchecked and unchanged, um, they could result in severe complications. And I think certainly to their um, pessaries, um, certain pessary types, for example, the gel horn, which are more difficult to change. So it's not something that, for example, your uh, GP would be able to uh, attend to on a regular basis, um, unlike uh, uh, the ease of changing a ring pessary. Okay, so what are the complications with um, pessary change, well, uh, uh, pessary use. Well, it's, it's certainly um, uh, complications that all of us are aware. Um, patients can uh, present with a persistent vaginal discharge. Um, they can present with uh, bleeding, which could result from laceration or ulceration as a result of the foreign body, um, you know, causing friction, rubbing against the, the thin epithelial uh, walls. Um, they could present with infection. Um, and of course, if the pessary was not sitting well, they could um, present with vaginal pain um, and uh, voiding and bowel dysfunction, for example, are uh, not uncommon uh, complaints by these patients. And of course, uh, one of the uh, uh, more serious uh, complications would be if a pa patient uh, presented with uh, an impacted pessary. And what I mean by that is that it is embedded into the vagina wall and uh, making it uh, um, impossible to remove it in the clinical setting. So these women may well need to have an anesthetic to, um, to remove this uh, impacted pessary. Okay, another very common reason why surgery would be preferred is if obviously um, the pessary has failed to control the uh, POP symptoms. So, um, you know, repeated, uh, um, um, what do you call displacement or, uh, of these pessaries, you know, patients say, well, you know, they fitted me with a larger pessary. Um, I went home, I went to the toilet uh, to, try and open my bowels and out came the pessary. So this is not an unusual complaint. Okay, so we'll move on to certain factors that have been associated with pessary failure. And these have been uh, quoted repeatedly by um, um, studies that have been done. So if a patient, for example, had um, previous surgery that has resulted in a short vaginal length, and more so if the vaginal length is uh, equal or less than six centimeters. Um, if the patient on examination was uh, found to have a, void, a wide uh, vaginal introitus, um, so anything equivalent to uh, four or more uh, finger breaths uh, in diameter, 
Um, if the patient has had um, many children before, um, if the patient also complained of stress incontinence, or in her medical history, she's had a previous hysterectomy, especially if this hysterectomy was done for uh, pelvic organ prolapse in the past. And of course, if she's had previous um, prolapse uh, surgery, and, and lastly, if uh, she on examination was found to have a large rectocele. So these are the factors that have been identified by studies to be particularly associated with pessary failure. So if a patient presented with any or a combination of any of these factors, um, be warned that there's a high chance that she may be coming back to your clinic in the very near future, complaining that the pessary has fallen out. So um, why, why is it that, um, you know, a, a wide introitus or what sometimes we call it um, an enlarged genital hiatus matter? Well, um, I see it this way. This is the level three level of, if you look at the Delancey's classification, this is the pelvic floor, level three. And it's made out of the perineal uh, body and of course uh, the pelvic floor itself. And as I explain to the patients, I say, well, if your um, window, the introital opening is wide, it's like having a large window. So everything else is gonna fall out through that window a lot easier. So if your genital hiatus um, is uh, widened, this is going to greatly increase the risk of you having a pessary that will displace. Now, I think this diagram nicely illustrates that. These are the common pessaries that we use in a clinic. This is the ring pessary, of course, propping things up. Very useful for stage uh, two pe um, uh, prolapse. Um, and of course, for the more advanced prolapse, three and four, we use a gel horn. But you see, if the um, pelvic floor or the um, genital hiatus is very widened, if this window was widened, these pessaries will probably not sit very well and it's very easy for them to get expelled out. You need to have an intact perineum for these to sit inside uh, comfortably. Okay, so I'll move on. When else? When else would we prefer surgery over pessary? I think Professor Roy had uh, told us um, about uh, the potential complications of having a significant uh, prolapse. And this can certainly uh, result in voiding dysfunction. Um, and even when you've got a pessary that is uh, in, uh, uh, in situ, women can still present with um, significant prolapse, a, a sister seal that's not properly controlled. These patients can still um, uh, complain or present with recurrent urinary tract infections, uh, retention, overflow incontinence, and of course, if uh, uh, the problem was uh, serious, renal impairment. Now, if you had a distal uh, uh, obstruction, um, say for example, a significant uh, urethral obstruction, you could potentially have bilateral hydronephrosis uh, causing uh, long-term damage potentially to your kidneys. And in this case, um, the, of course, some patients who do present with other um, um, problems um, who, which require surgery, for example, the patient came to us with uh, a large uterus with fibroids, if she needed a hysterectomy for uh, um, heavy um, uh, menses, if she also had concurrent stress um, uh, incontinence or fecal incontinence or something like in this patient, a concurrent rectal prolapse, these patients, if they required surgery for other conditions, then in this scenario, if they're going to undergo uh, an anesthetic, then it's preferable, obviously, to offer them surgery for their POP. So really, in summary, um, I'm coming to my last two slides. The pessary for sure, and, and it's been used long-term, we all know that this is effective way of treating POP symptoms, um, but of course it is not without its associated complications. Um, surgery, um, we all know, of course, all patients would try and avoid surgery. I think if they were given a, a good, a safe alternative, but of course, 
some are unable to avoid surgery um, and we all, we all have to counsel them, of course, uh, regarding the associated risks uh, with surgery, but also to warn them that it, there is a risk of recurrence. It is surgery as uh, by far not a curative answer. Um, and I think really also to bear in mind the cost of surgery can be significant. And I think um, this, I, I, I managed to find this paper and I'm, I'm sorry, it is quite an old paper. Um, it's looking at the, uh, the expenditure uh, for the cost of surgery, uh, specifically for uh, treatment of pelvic organ prolapse in America in 1997 was reported to be more than 1 billion USD. So obviously we're now in the year 2020 and I'm sure that 1 billion has escalated to many billions. But then of course, we then have to balance this up with the cost that is incurred to the patient, to the family, and of course, to our healthcare system as well, um, of long-term follow-ups uh, with the use of pessary. And I'm afraid I can't, I couldn't find any, um, you know, um, papers looking at this um, to compare uh, between the cost of surgery and pessary. Um, my last slide. Um, so really, clinical assessment is paramount. We know all this. Um, but of course, we always have to individualize our management. Uh, we have to look at it from the patient's perspectives. What is it that they um, that matter to them? What is it that bother them? What are their concerns? Certainly, as their surgeon, we um, you know there's so many questions that come through our mind um, after we've assessed them, taking the history, done the clinical examination, and taken the patient's um, concerns into our consideration. Others really, it's um, things that are out of our control, such as the COVID situation that we have now um, uh, that's affecting us. So counseling, of course, at the end of the day, we should always involve the patient and the family in the decision-making. And I think very important to address the expectations of not just the patient, a family, but also our own expectations. So I think that's my last slide and I leave you with this. Uh, I don't know what springs to mind, but this is the, uh, the decorative uh, uh, structure right in front of Bristol Royal uh, Hospital for uh, Children, where I trained as a medical student. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kong Su Yen. So you've put the pessary versus surgery in a very concise manner, and I think we all appreciate that very much. So thank you for that brilliant lecture. Um, we have a few questions coming up, but before we move on to the case discussion, uh, I would like to just ask the panelists and the audience for just three minutes of your time, if you don't mind. Uh, we'd like to play the video of the Ayuga 2021 from Dr. Roy, because the audio wasn't quite um, concise in the last play. Is that all right? Clarence, to you. For more than 50 years, Singapore has not only existed, we've thrived. But beneath our glossy exterior and bright lights, something else burns brightly. Our passion. It's made us a nation of vision and imagination. A city with endless possibilities. The Singapore story is one of turning possibilities into reality. This is a place where ideas, passions, technology, capital and people meet to spark new collaborations and ventures. That is why Singapore is well-placed to help you grow your business, to discover new opportunities, and to network with the smartest and most innovative people in your fields. In addition to hosting global business events, we've also been the stage for the IMF World Bank meetings, Cybos, the inaugural Youth Olympic Games, and the world's only Formula One night street race. We are proud to give each event a unique Singaporean flavour. 
our strong and developed key sectors will allow you to tap opportunities, insights, and form partnerships. Singapore is located in the heart of Southeast Asia, with access to 4 billion people within a 7-hour flight radius. Your delegates will arrive at Changi Airport, consistently voted one of the world's best airports, with a seamless immigration system and smooth access to the city. Delegates can choose from a wide selection of hotels, from luxury to more intimate boutique options. Our efficient and affordable public transport system makes getting around a breeze so you can easily enjoy what our city has to offer. To complement your business agenda, Singapore offers vibrant and diverse leisure options with our colourful multicultural heritage, world-class entertainment and a wide range of dining offerings from the world's best fine dining restaurants to our renowned street food and hawker centres. We believe this seamless integration of work and play makes Singapore a compelling destination for your event, one with endless possibilities to learn, grow, connect and have fun. We look forward to welcoming you to Singapore, a country where passions are made possible. Thank you, Dr. Roy, for sharing that very interesting video. So I sure I speak for the rest of the world to say that we all look forward to traveling next year. Yeah, and hopefully. we hope to see you and everyone in Singapore. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so we might move on to the uh, case discussion session. Okay, Dr. Suvik, you're back with us. Good, because the first question is for you. Um, so very simply, um, what is the cost of laser treatment? The cost in the, the cost, you mean the money pay, right? Yeah, so I suppose in Thailand, yeah. Yeah, in Thailand, in Thailand, it uh, for the private hospital is about uh, how's it in, in Malaysia language? Let me call. It's about to uh, one thousand ten thousand baht to ten to twenty thousand baht per visit. So it's a, uh, it almost the same price in Malaysia right now. So okay. it depends on it's a, it depends on women buy buying the the package or paying one by one. Mm -hmm. So the 10,000 baht would be a single session or? Single session. Uh, single session, okay. okay. And they would require, what, three sessions? It depends on which, which machine that you use. If you use carbon dioxide laser, fraction of CO2, usually uh, it depends on, and again, it depends on the type of machine and the power you use. But for the conventional one, the CO2 mm -hmm. laser right now, you need once a month for three consecutive months and the effect will last about six to six months to 12 months for one, okay. one session. Okay. And for, for the Erbium Yak, it depends on the, the company machine. But usually, you, the Erbium Yak, you need only once. Okay. It's quite strange, right? But only once for six months. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, the, F, the, uh, the efficacy of the Erbium Yak, the interval may be shorter. The, the, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the time effect. The, CO2 may a little bit longer. So duration depends on each woman, six, six months to 12 months for one session treatment. Mm. Okay. So Thank the price, know. it depends on you're going to the private hospital or private mm -hmm. clinic because of yeah. the cost of, you know, the, the cost they charge you differently. For the, for the, for the government right now, we, do, do, we, we don't have, how to say, we don't have the standard price. We, in, in Thailand, for the government, we have standard price for each operation, but not for the laser yet. Okay. I see. Thank you for that. And um, second question also to Dr. Suvit. Many thanks for the comprehensive presentation on laser vagina rejuvenation. May I ask, what is your primary indication for the CO2 laser in your practice? So right now, all I, all I did right now, I do only the in-research. In-research, women with vaginal trophy that didn't want to use the the estrogen or in research. So as I mentioned before that, because of right now, all the organization or the IUCA, ICS, many mm -hmm. guidelines saying that you should keep it in research. So, but just practically, if you want to give the treatment to your patient, 
that because of laser is something new, modern, right? And yes. she want to try it because of this is not the good thing about laser is not hormonal treatment. Some right. women may be afraid of using the hormone about the cancer risk or something, right? So if you want to keep the treatment, if for the research, okay, you do it because you have consent form, you have information sheet, everything, blah, blah, blah. But for the clinical practice, if you really want to keep your private patient or something, you should tell her that the uh, about the information about that this is something new there is no guideline about this thing yet and uh, there is no how to say uh, most of the guidelines suggest that we should keep it for the research but for the clinical but the good thing is that they have some information saying that it's working for the vaginal atrophy it worked quite well and there's some little information for the straight continent in the my case the straight the laser make improve the symptom of straight incontinence, but not the severe case, okay? And only in the short term, follow up. So you should, we should tell our patient about this and let her understand this. If she know the limitation of the data and she willing to accept this one, you still okay, you know what I mean, right? So yeah. if you talk about the, that, they have some limitation of the, of, of the information of the long term follow up. And if the women accept that, like a consent before doing the laser, there will be no problem, even if she have complication. And we should tell them that laser is not without complication, but the, the complication is really few percentage, really small case number reported. You get what I mean, right? So, but as, but as a, as a, uh, as a organization, as, 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 a, as a, my OBGYN society, we will suggest that we should keep it for the research not for the clinical practice, for the general practice, for the clinical in general. Okay, you got what I mean, right? So, but, 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 but in case that there are some good things about laser, it's good for, the, in case that women have side effects, have a in contraindication to use the vaginal hormone, to use a hormone. Mm -hmm. For example, breast cancer, or any cancer, or any estrogen depending tumor that she, she got, she cannot use a hormone. Maybe, Laser is a good choice. For example, breast cancer survivor, she, she is taking tamoxifen, right? She have dry vagina. It's okay. You can you you you, you can you can try the vagina laser in this case. So would it be suffice to sort of say that we do not recommend use for mal POP or SUI except for research purpose? Yes. And in terms of the uh, vaginal atrophy, we can fall back on the Canadian guidelines, which is the only body to sort of commit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right now, to be said, because if she have the problem of the complication of laser, she can go back and sue you. This yep. is the thing. Absolutely. Right now, right now, there is no lawsuit about this thing in Thailand right now because the case of complication reported is really minimum. And mostly doctor that doing this is a general GP doing the laser in Thailand right now. Not many mm -hmm. OBGYN doing that. But we have to wait and see until the, the number is more many people doing. Finally, we will see some case of lawsuit with vaginal laser. It's the same yep. in Malaysia. So right now, what we do right now in, in my society, we just wait and see. We, we, we wait for to see for the result of the uh, clinical study and the guideline from the others. And we'll, maybe I will talk to Malaysian society. Thai, we talk to Malaysian. In Asia, we talk together. And we can, we can uh, conclude for the... Uh, Asian guidelines something for the, for the laser. Right. Um, there's a last question for you, as Dr. Suvin, as well. Um, I okay, think please. the audience would like to know, in your study in the Menopause 2020 that you recently published, how many passes of the laser did you perform? Was it a single or multiple pass? Three, three. passes. Okay. One, one, once a month for three times, and then follow up for six months. If the women says, okay, we'll, we'll follow up until she got another symptom again. But because this is our, our, only our research, so after the research, so after the the the, uh, the efficacy, of the effect of the laser is gone, we we go back to the con to the conventional treatment like a vaginal estrogen or something. Brilliant, thank you, Dr. Subit, for that. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm, yes. we, we, are, we are doing uh, some study about the laser CO two laser and the urban jack in the others indication right now, hmm. but but uh, almost in the research, okay. Well, I think your sham control group was quite good because not many of the studies do that. So the placebo effect would be quite apparent yeah. when, uh, in your results. 
So that's good. Uh, Dr. Roy, Dr. Kong, uh, any sort of opinions? Do you practice vaginal rejuvenation in your practice personally? Thank you, sir. It's, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. I, and I think it's very important to explain to the patient because I think since um, it's very sort of, um, you know, it's been marketed as the, the solution. It's a sexy way of sort of advertising something new. You know, patients say, right, I don't want surgery. I want laser. So there are some who have obviously started coming to our clinics asking our opinions about laser. And I think it's very important to actually explain to them that we do not have long-term data, safety data. And in fact, what has been reported is that obviously the use, the indication really, as um, Dr. Subit has said, is very much for vaginal atrophy. And again, only in women, probably we should think about using that for women who've got contraindication to estrogen use. Um, there's no reason why they cannot use you know, topical estrogen. Um, because it's in a trial and tested way and we know it works, I think it's a matter of actually explaining to them. So I don't think we should desert um, you know, a well-known and a therapy that we know is effective for something that's got no, very little data. So I think if we explain to the patient, they understand. And I think they appreciate the, the fact that, you know, obviously what they see on Dr. Google mm -hmm. You know, it's you can read anything and anything you want, but at the end of the day, they actually, I think, most of the time understand that you know some of it is fake news or it's news that's not, you know, to be trusted. So I think they probably, because they've come to you, it's your duty, I think, to actually explain to them, and take the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can I say something? Uh, get, get of course. Yes. Of yeah. course. Um, Regarding the topical estrogens for patients with um, breast CA, um, the ACOG, in fact, has a guideline um, mm -hmm. three years ago, which states that you should try other things first, but it also states that the topical estrogen, topical estrogen is safe. The reason is that uh, the amount used is very, very low. And if you use VEGFAM, previously it was 0.25, now it's 0.1 milligram. And a lot of studies have shown that if you check the blood levels of estradiol, the patient using the uh, vaginal pastries every day, every two days, every three days, there's a slight increase after two weeks, but thereafter the level drops. So if the estradiol levels in your bloodstream is less than post, same as postmenopausal range, it's not more than that. In theory, it will not cause, should not cause any ill effects. So especially patients with very bad recurrent UTI, we know that the estrogen, vaginal estrogen is a cause of, is a mainstay of treatment. Those patients should be offered, and I always tell them that we check your estrogen now, you can check after one month, two months, and three months. And if there's no raise, then you can bring this letter, bring your result to your oncologist or radiologist, and they can tell them that uh, in fact, uh, there's no increased risk. And you look at the WHI study, the, as you know, the WHI study, estrogen and progesterone after five years, uh, was eight per 10,000 risk of breast CA. It was in a combination group, not the estrogen group. Estrogen group alone, after seven years, no increased risk at all. So the culprit is progesterone, not estrogen. So this is uh, actually a misinformation of the WHI study. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yes, on that note, I was just wondering, are there any particular types of breast cancer that are contraindicated or are they contraindicated across the board or... You know, in terms of ER, PR, negative, positive, things like that. I think all that is also important. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a ER, ER, ER positive, then obviously you're more apprehensive. But uh, I, as I said, the ACOG has a guideline, and uh, some of those research has shown also it's relatively safe. If you monitor the blood levels, if the trial levels is not raised, then I think that's reassuring. Because in theory, mm -hmm. if estrogen levels are not raised, as for your post multiple rate, theoretically, it should not affect the breast. Yeah. Okay, can I, can I add something? Yes, Dr. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks, Dr. Roy. Um, I agree with Dr. with Dr. Roy that it's okay to use the vaginal estrogen. Many patients and, and ask me, many breast cancer survivor, because before I'm I'm having the, the vaginal laser, right? Using that only report of the breast cancer survivor of using the gynofor, the vaginal estriol, plus with the lactobacilli, right? You know, I think you have the same, right? Gynofor. Uh, to use the safety is only six months. They have the long, long, uh, the longer, the longest follow up for the breast cancer survivor that using the hormone that is safe is six months. Mm -hmm. We don't have the longest, longer 
follow up than the six month in breast cancer survivor. I think they got right now they are doing the long term follow up in the breast cancer survivor that using the vaginal hormone. But right now up to six months is safe. Sure. Uh, I, I think they should be used as short term, not as long term. Long term, yes, I think yes. you should monitor very, very closely, especially those with recurrent UTI. We keep having UTI, um, you know, and uh, if you use topical intrusions, at least those in not in breast cancer, nearly always it resolves the problem. Otherwise, you can use probiotics because probiotics do also help the vagina pH to change from uh, alkaline to acidic and things like uh, um, probiotics and also um, uh, cranberry or blueberry, so reduce adhesiveness between the uh, gram negative bacilli and the lining of the bladder. All this can help. So I think uh, it's something I think is still under research. I think it's a good thing that laser is there as an alternative for those patients who cannot use it or apprehensive or fearful of using hormone. So I think there is a place, there is definitely a place for everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to add something that I think from my experience, the most if you want to use the laser, you have to cope with expectation of the patient because yeah, yeah. satisfaction depends on expectation. Yeah. So because the women, if you work in a private hospital, in the private clinic, they pay a lot of money for laser, yeah. right? Yeah. They yeah. expect yeah. much. Yeah. But yeah. if the effect, even the effect is not good, you yeah. may have the problem with the patient. Yes. And the worst case that if you got the complication, you can got the problem. Yeah, so yeah. you have to, how to say, uh, calibrate yeah. the expectation of the patient with your treatment before giving, giving them the treatment. You know what I mean, right? Like a, yeah. Uh, yeah. Giving, the, uh, give the, giving the counseling about the laser before to prevent the uh, complication of problem in the future. Yeah. I think for sexual function, it's very important that uh, you do the PSQ, PSQ uh, 12, at least uh, there's a, you can show that there's the benefit objectively or subjectively rather than, uh, you know, yeah, I think that's very important, especially you're doing it as a research purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. There's some interest in uh, Dr. Suvet, your study. Just a few questions. So how many patients were involved in that study? I think they're referring to the Monopause 2020 study as well. Yes. Um, were, all, were most of the women in pre-menopausal, and did you use vaginal estrogen cream in combination with the CO2 laser? No, it, it, for my study, we have 88, 88 women. So 88, randomized yeah. into two groups, the sham and without sham, the, the laser and sham, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, no, hormo no hormonal treatment, just only the laser and sham group, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 88 women for the whole study. Okay, can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes. Um, can I just ask, I mean, how is, um, to Dr. Uh, to mm -hmm. Prof. is is the practice of um, laser surgery actually for this indication regulated in Thailand? Uh, as I mentioned before, the laser, the laser machine is, uh, is approved by the Thai FDA only because laser is a machine, the machine is approved in Thailand, but because it's a machine, right? There is no uh, strict with the indication for the treatment, not like medic, not not like the drug or medication. So, if you do use, you can use the laser with women because they only approved for the for, for the laser, but not, but you have to be on your own about indication that you use. If they have a problem, you have to choose and uh, is this to your society. To approve to uh, to say to support you or something, you got so like that. is it right? only doctors who could um, do laser therapy in Thailand? I mean, or do you do you have to be certified or um, you know do do you have how, how do you actually? Um... No, no. Anybody, any GP in my country, we have only some some limited uh, how to say procedure that is controlled by Thai Medical Association. For example, IVF. You have to be, you have to got the fellowships. Uh, you have to be a, a fel You have to finish your fellowship training for reproductive medicine to do the IVF. Okay, you know, you got what I mean, right? Or only some operation that is strict, but usually in general, GP can do anything what, uh, anything that they want to do, but they have to prove that. It, if if you got the lawsuit, you have to prove that. You do it without how to say, you're not uh, you are you are keen to do that. 
you are because I commend you. You are only using it in the research setting because you are actually collecting data. You're reporting on yes. your outcomes. Yes. Yes. But presumably, obviously, there are a lot of practitioners out there who are, yes. um, you know, doing yes. the laser therapy, um, yes. probably not even auditing their own data. I yes. just really wondered, have you had to uh, deal with the complications that have arisen from laser therapy? You, so mean, you, mean, you mean I or them? From other, other um, practitioners. Right now, there is no, uh, there's no few, last few cases of the complication of laser are only minimum or like a burning or dyspregenia. So there's not a big problem after the laser treatment. But the problem is we have no regulation of who can do it. What is the indication to do this? You know mm -hmm. what I mean, right? So yeah. right now it still is a, is a uh, very, I'm going my, my west, you are right? Why, why west, you know? Everybody <laughs> can do it. Yeah. I think it's the same, it's like in Malaysia, right? It's difficult to keep regulation right now because of we are waiting. It's really something new. It's, this, is, this thing is similar to what you know, match in the past. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe just a last question on vaginal rejuvenation before we move on to other questions. Um, I think the typical scenario of even not, not just about laser, but even about doing surgery. So the typical young girl who will step into your clinic and say, I want uh, this designer vagina, designer vulva, would you do it or how would you react to that kind of patient? Mm, maybe Dr. Subit would like to start us off. So so this is, uh, I just gave That's a talk for, about the yeah. ethics. You have, it's about like, ethical, about, you, you mean about female genital cosmetic surgery? Correct, right? yeah. Okay. That have, you have to follow, follow the principle of ethical uh, issue about this thing, right? Mm -hmm. The women have to be, you have to rule out the body dysmorphic, you know, that be uh, body dysmorphic <laughs> disease about psychology problem that she thought that she is have a bad figure, but mm -hmm. usually she's, she's normal, right? She says, right. you have to rule out psychology problem. And then the women have to, have to be mature, not that you cannot do the operation in a teenage women. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, because and we have to be mature and the women have to, to know about exactly what you want to do what is the operation you got you you're going to give her about the chance of com uh, side effect and complication and the women have to pay money by her own you do, you do not, do not help them to use the uh, government or national insurance to pay for them it's something about and you, the women have the right to know about the complication and the good and bad choice about this thing all right. Mm. So you would literally send them up for a psychiatric assessment? Is that what you mean? Because that's what the guidelines tell us to do. Uh, uh, they have a, they have a, uh, they have, they have, they call the, a questionnaire throughout the both body dysmorphic syndrome (BDD), <sighs> right? Uh, they can, we can, we can corpse questionnaire. I just do the translation into Thai and do the validation and reliability test, psychometric test. I just finish it. I'm going to report that one in corpse questionnaire to rule out. Uh, so for any cosmetic surgery, you have to you. It's better for you to use this questionnaire to screen the bo body dysmorphic syndrome. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Kong. Any thoughts? On yeah, I end? think I think it's obviously important. Again, I think to start from the beginning, take a history. Why is it that they feel that they've got an you know an abnormal vagina? Why do they think they need intervention? You know, is it them who feel that they're abnormal? Is it their partner? Uh, you know, where, where has this concern arisen from? And I think certainly to examine them yourself. And I think, and I would have thought that, you know, by you as a professional examining them and actually reassuring them that, that you know, perhaps it is normal, that there's a variation of normal. I think um, Prof. Suvit showed us, you know, in this talk that um, a lot of, uh, this misconceptions of what a normal, perfect vagina should look like is very much what has been portrayed in the media, you know, um, and uh, what's on the magazines, you know, what, what you should look, what is the ideal vagina, what is normal. But I think it's also, and of course that is completely unnatural. We know that, you know, vaginas look very different and they all are actually all part of normal, the normal spectrum. So I think it's, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult. I certainly would not be in a hurry to operate on a, on a young 
uh, lady. And uh, I think in this scenario, I think it's a lot more um, sort of assessment as you say, yes, psychologically, but also, you know, why is it that they've come? Why have they come to you? What is the concern? Are there any other background issues, you know, and marital issues, relationship issues? Um, yeah, so. Point taken, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I think we move on to the pastries. Okay, can I can add something. Yes, I can okay. add something, yeah. I just oh, finished yes. doing that, the, the things that Dr. Dr. Su Yen is talking. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh -huh. I just, I think it be interesting for each country in Asia to do that. Okay, can you see it? I just do it. Uh, I just publishing a study we call variation of genital appearance in Thai ah. women. So I, I do measure the, uh, the appearance, the size, mm -hmm. the color, and the shape of the vulva and labia major minor before to show that what is the normal or the women that is happy with their genital appearance. So I measure them. I, I use some questionnaire to test that they are satisfied with their appearance and they measure the size. So the size vary, the, the labia minor vary from da 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 da. So I use this parameter and this, this, uh, while, uh, this, uh, I would say this data to show women before they really want to do the female co genital cosme cosmetic surgery. If they think that they are abnormal, I confirm that they are normal or not normal in for my study to reassure them before they decide to do the surgery. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah, that would be good feedback for the patients. Actually, <laughs> we should really take this up. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor Subit, for sharing that. Okay, mm -hmm. you 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 can search this paper for at okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. So we might move on to a few questions on pessaries. Uh, so probably to Dr. Kong, since uh, you gave the lecture. Hmm. So what type of base occupying pessaries do you use? And um, what are the differences? I suppose it means it's one better than the other. Um, I think it's very much um, from the indication. I mean, I have, my, my experience is only really with the gel horn pessary. That's okay. the one that's readily available in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a whole range of, um, you know, space occupying pessaries of various shapes and sizes. Um, some of them um, not just treat um, prolapse, but also incontinence. Um, but um, I, I can, I'm afraid I can only comment on the gel on pastry because that's okay. my only experience. I'm not quite sure whether um, Prof Roy or Prof Suvit can add to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it's difficult to keep a range of pastries because they're all expensive to order and also they all have different sizes. So, you know, and then you have to order different sizes. So. Uh, I think most people like we only stick to I stick to ring and gel horn only. The ring pastry doesn't work, then I use gel horn. If gel doesn't work, then they may have to have a surgery. I think we have other things like cube pastries, uh, donut, and uh, you know, jerung and uh, different types of pastries. But it's difficult to keep them all. Yeah. Mm, do, yeah. You do, uh, do you do the ring pastries with the knobs for stress incontinence? That one is uh, theoretically supposed. The knob is supposed to be for stress incontinence. Yeah. Supposed to Are be any good? bladder neck, you know. Uh, I've mm -hmm. not tried those, so, you know, yeah, yeah. In so, the, yeah. the certain pastries that they say, you know, should be um, removed um, by the, uh, the patient has to be comfortable to remove it, you know, prior to bedtime and, and all that. But I think from our experience with the Asian women, they Difficult. will not be able, well, majority yeah. would not even entertain the idea. Yeah. Even yeah. applying the topical estrogen, sometimes they find that that yeah. itself is very difficult. So asking them to actually um, take a pastry, you know, out and replace it on a regular basis, I think it's probably uh, uh, it's going to be yeah. difficult. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Unless I think I've seen some pastries from a neighboring country made of latex. There is a there are two wedges on on each side. The wedge is like half or three quarters, so they can easily bend it and remove it and put it back. Uh, but it's made of latex and soft, but uh, gives a very very. Uh, Smell, unfortunately, it smells quite badly because of the latex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, at, at my center, can I ask something? At, at my center, yes. usually because I have a lot of, of, of women with prolapse, um, elderly women, right? More than 67, 80, 90, something, right? A lot of. So, what I do right now, I, I have to uh, prepare donut, geo horn, every, every size in the big box, and then to, to test them before before they go on. And they have to try the pestle at my clinic, two hours at least in my clinic. Walk, go to the toilet to be sure that the size fit. So they have to, to, to buy 
the real one, go back home. I have to, I have, I will talk to them before that. Even I choose the good side for you, the best side for you, but you have still have a chance that one week after you come back, the side may, may be too, too big or too small. Like you have a chance. It depends on how you feel. You can come back, have to buy a new one again. But, and, but, but the pastry in Thailand is not expensive. So most women accept this one. Okay. And okay. my experience about the, the ring with knob, usually like Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Roy said, it works with straight continent, but the problem with ring with knob that it doesn't stop the leakage, it's only improve the leakage for about 40 to 50% only improve the leakage. So you, women do not expect to use the ring with knob to stop the leakage, to be dry. No, it's impossible. So you have to know, you have, you have to accept this one. So, but 50% is okay for her or not. It's up to her severity. If she have mm -hmm. a big leakage, liquid knob, maybe not a good choice. It depends. Okay. Also depends where the knob is sitting, isn't it? If you're sitting in a bladder neck or urethra, it's difficult, <laughs> difficult to tell. The length of the vagina is different. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then, uh, uh, we had a, another question, Sui. Because you, let's say you have a different pastry, you change it, it doesn't fit. What happens? Do the patient have to pay? Or can you send it for autoclaving or just throw it away? Because, you know, but because our patients are expensive. $150 for each pastry. The testing, right? You mean yeah. the testing, right? Usually, yeah. so at, at, my, at, at my clinic, we have all, for example, I have rings, set up rings, pastry, yes. set yes. up gel horn, yes. set up donut, set up okay. cube, set okay. up garu jerung in yes. different size. And then yes. I use it, right? Yes. And do what, uh, so up, uh, after the testing, yes. I watch it. Clean it. And you autoclave it. it. Uh, autoclave it can use again, right? Yes, yeah. autoclave, or you can do the do the, uh, like uh, the gas sterilization. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes, ethylene, ethylene chloride. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then that's good because otherwise you throw it away, right? Expensive. No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah. don't throw it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the yeah. But, but, but the problem is that once they buy from from uh, from the hospital, they cannot return it. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Thank so, you. So some women they donate. So if, if they want to, to change the size, some women, they donate the old one to our stock for, 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 te for testing purpose. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, right. So do you always prescribe estrogen cream in all your patients on pessaries or not? Uh, we do. I do for everyone. Everyone? Yeah. yeah. Everyone. I, yes, I do. Uh, I, I just uh, have uh, give a lecture about review of the mm -hmm. Estro of estrogen in pestily use. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, most of the uh, most of the study that do the uh, randomized control trial whether to use the giving the topical estrogen or not. So the topical estrogen, there's no evidence that you can decrease the complication with estrogen. Estrogen, what what kind of estrogen does not help prevent the complication? Okay, this the uh, erosion or bleeding or some infection is the same. But they have one, only one paper saying that the virtual estrogen can improve the compliance of the pestle at one and two years. So in women that use the, pes use the vaginal hormone with pestle, the women tend to continue the pestle longer than without. Less so painful, right now, less, less atrophy, less pain, I think, is that the reason? They use it because when it's very atrophic, it's very painful and uh, yeah. dry, very painful. Except for the, except for the vaginal atrophy symptom, improved yeah. after the 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 yeah. the, yeah. the pessary use. Okay, so so to to keep the vaginal estrogen, it's up to you. Because of there is no how to say no serious complication of side effect. But the but the benefit is only small. Only increase the compliance only from the data right now. Okay. Just taking into account sometimes with women with limited dexterity can be quite challenging. Yeah, but if there's a benefit to it, I think they can be convinced. Okay. Um, so with elderly patients, do you ever increase the maintenance dose? I think most of it uses uh, most of it prescribed as two times a week. Do you ever consider increasing the dose to a daily or doctors of it? Yeah. Um only I usually two two times a week is is a mm -hmm. It's a standard dose, right? But in right. women that the, they use the pessary, in some women they use the pessary and they didn't remove too often. They can cause the erosion, right? 
and yep. uh, erosion. So if you found the uh, the generation tissue or the the erosion, I will increase the dosage for my for my practice. I increase the dosage maybe three, four, or five times a week. It depends on how bad is is the erosion. But after erosion improve, the women can care personally better. Like for example, taking out at night time every night, I will going back to the normal doses. Okay. Thanks. And um, a question about gel horn, maybe Dr. Kong can enlighten us. If the gel horn is, um, I think it means if we have difficulty removing the gel horn due to a patient that's not very cooperative. So apart from bringing her to theater, are there any tips? Well, <laughs> I suppose uh, that's difficult, isn't it? I think mm -hmm. if it's, it depends on whether it's actually just her clenching and not letting you, you know, access or whether it is actually prepped properly embedded, but I think it's difficult. I think it's, it's, it's near impossible. I think you've got a patient that's not going to be cooperating. I think you, you need to take them in and, you know, to, to theatre to do an EUA and, and remove it. I think it's otherwise very traumatic. If anything, that trauma that they sustain while you're struggling to remove it may itself be a reason why she will never wear a, a pestry again. That itself will be, I think, an indication for surgery. Point taken. <laughs> yeah, that's something, right? So yes. this is another, I agree with Dr. Dr. Su Yen that this is another contraindication for Pesley. If the woman cannot care Pesley by herself, mm -hmm. there's nobody in her family to help her to care the Pesley. This is contraindication to use Pesley in this case. Otherwise, you can face the problem of yeah. embedded Pesley in the vagina. Yeah, and that this is a very important point to actually explain to the patient before you fit the surgery. The fact that um, regular, you know, monitoring, examination, um, and follow up is essential. If they are unable to to do that, then you know this will be a good reason to go more towards the surgical uh, uh, route, because we we know that obviously you know um, pessaries that uh, go unchecked. Um, have got this, uh, severe, you know, associated severe complications, you know, sort of uh, resulting in severe erosions and even sort of fistulas into the bladder and the rectum. Uh, we've certainly seen complications like that, and it's certainly not something you would want to, you know, subject the patient to. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Can, can, can I just add something? Uh, I think I agree with all of you, but I think when you downsize, let's say you're using a ring pastry and a change to gel horn, I think the gel horn should be slightly smaller than the ring yeah. because if ideally the, any pastry should have a little bit of space. If the very, very tight whole vagina like falls over it, then it's very, very tight, hard to remove. Sometimes the pastry keeps going further inside because it's curved, this concave. You can't catch the, the, the plate to pull it out. So what I do sometimes, I use a sponge faucet just to pull on the handle down a little bit so that my finger can go behind the shelf and hook it out. If you cannot reach the plate, you just keep going further further, further back inside, you can't do anything. So this one hint, the finger should go behind and hook it out. Yeah, so you need something the sponge wants to pull it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Because there is suction, there is a yes. suction Su action. Yes. When you pull it, actually, the, uh... you pull it, it doesn't come out. Pull it straight, it doesn't come out unless you move it. So actually the suction is quite strong. Yeah. Now, can, I, can I ask something? Yes. I, I have some trick. I have experience with some trick. So to, to use, to remove the Johan pessary, it's better to ask the women to pushing a little bit. Yeah. And, and the, the concave shape of uh, the side of the gel horn will slip out. So you can put the finger behind and take it out easily. So let the women push while you move. This is a, a trick for the gel horn. Yeah, I think because, because, make it yeah. much better. Because, because when, when she is pushing, or coughing, she cannot contract the pelvic floor. Otherwise, she should co automatically contract the pelvic floor. So when she's pushing or coughing, they cannot contract the pelvic floor. You try and see, it's difficult to contract the pelvic floor by your coughing or pushing. Yeah, and that will help to remove it. Remove it, yes. Yeah. Okay, we might just try that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, the next question, do the panelists, do you suggest vaginal douching with lactobacillus containing contained liquid soap to prevent infection and erosions? Uh, vaginal douching. I, don't, I, I do not believe in yeah, yeah. at all. I don't okay. think anything should go in there. I think other oh, yeah. than topical <laughs> estrogen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So there's no yeah. reason to do that. And I think as Dr. Roy had uh, pointed out, we have to just inform the patient that the vagina is not a sterile environment. 
that all it's important that we have a balanced flora um, and uh, and that it's best to leave things be not to uh, disrupt the the balance yes yeah that's right and yeah. uh, there's a lot in the market now obviously Correct. you know a lot of these cleansing gels yeah. and whatnot yeah. um mm -hmm. and um yeah and and if you ask the patient you know who does come presents with uh recurrent uh, vaginal infections they will for sure would have gone down the route of you know using all these various uh uh things that they bought from the pharmacy mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of, uh, uh, I think patients and uh, doctors or some of us are not, uh, not aware that the vagina pH is acidic when you're pre-menopause. That protects the vagina from being colonized by grand active uh, bacilli. After menopause, vagina pH with alkaline loses its protection. So it's estrogen that causes the vagina pH to change from alkaline to acidic and also um, probiotics. So these are two things that help the vagina pH to become acidic to protect the vagina from colonized by grand active bacilli from the bowels and from the perineal regions. That's important. Probiotics and uh, using either bread, fruit, cranberry, and blueberry to reduce the adhesiveness between the bacteria and the lining of the bladder. All these things are helpful as well. Regular drinking, regular voiding. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Mm, okay. Uh, we might just leave the pessaries a bit. There's been quite a bit of interest around pessaries, which is good. <laughs> it is our first line. Okay. So uh, there's a question maybe for Dr. Roy. What is your opinion with regards to treating a 16-year-old? So this is a young girl, I assume, a completed family with a cervical descent of class two. Yeah. So a stage three prolapse in a very young girl. I think first thing, you must find out whether she's got any um, congenital abnormalities, any problems with, uh, she may have even um, uh, ehlers dalos syndrome, uh, a significant prolapse sometimes of the front and back, Sometimes they may have muffin syndrome, so things like that should be aware of. Uh, I've seen a patient with elongated cervix and uh, difficult to ring pastry didn't help. Eventually, a gel horn did help her, but uh, she didn't want any surgery, so she's been treated with a gel horn with elongated cervix. So how, how much how much is it bothering her, I think? But uh, And usually they have no other prolapse apart from elongated cervix. So maybe some collagen abnormality or some other uh, abnormality, Ehlers Dahlers syndrome. Yeah. Um, just sorry, just going back to Patrick, since you mentioned gel horn, how long term would you use a gel horn for? Are you talking, you know, one, two years sort of buying time? Do you use it up to 10 years, teens, things like that? Probably if they're sexually active, then they cannot have intercourse. That's the main problem. So if they're not sexually active, you can. But uh, the problem is that sometimes uh, you get erosion, abrasions, infection, it can happen. So we try and change the smaller size and put them on sometimes flagellatin for 10 days. And after that, Premarin and Premarin and, uh, and Vegifem until it heals uh, three, four weeks and repeat and then see how they are and, and insert again. As long as a gel horn, there's a gel horn now made by a timeless company called Penpack. It's much cheaper than the Milex and much softer as well. The Milex is a, a American, much more expensive and very, very stiff. The, this Taiwanese one is much softer. It's also made of silicone, but softer and cheaper mm -hmm. as well. The cost is at least three times cheaper. And uh, we find it very, very useful. Penpack, P-A-N-P-A-C. Penpack. <laughs> Everything exactly the same size. Yeah. I think the, can I just add, I think it's important um, to actually ascertain whether it's just isolated cervical elongation or whether mm -hmm. they've actually got uh, well. multi compartment, whether yeah. you've actually got uterine level one problem as well. Yes. So yes. It, I That's think right. if it is just cervical elongation, I think, of course, just shortening, doing a cervical amputation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, obviously, um, that may well be sufficient. Yes, yes. So we certainly offered that to the some of the younger patients that presented, and That's so right. far they've actually done very well. Yeah. So I would have thought, you know, someone young and potentially or is already yeah. sexually active, I think gel horn may not be the best answer because we know that it's going to be sexual intercourse yeah. is going to be very difficult. Yeah. See, but the, the only thing you see, there, there are some uh, critics of the Manchester, although I like it very much, because all depends how much cervix you have taken, because if you've taken too much of cervix, then whether it can cause either incompetence or stenosis, yeah. that's what the reproductive endocrinologists will always tell us, although I think not much data on that. Yeah, yeah. but I don't think you need to be that aggressive. I think yeah. it's a matter of just shortening enough to actually get it back into to the, vagina. the vagina, so that's yeah. not protruding. Yeah. Yeah, so the option filling a pessary would be um, Manchester. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So there is another question with um, Doctor to Doctor Roy. 
what is your opinion on the rectus fascius link? And do you still or will do you still practice match for urodynamic ur stress incontinence? Yes. I think that the rectus, rectus sheet sling has been in use for uh, uh, more than 100 years. I think it's still very, very effective. So in places where you don't have uh, um, uh, tape or mesh, a proline mesh, can be done, especially if you are very good at it, it's fine. The problem of this sort of meshes, it can be either too loose or too tight, causing avoiding problems, yeah. So uh, in Singapore, we still use the mid urethral tape or, or still being used, although there's some apprehension and some patients are getting worried. So because of that, uh, some are moving into laparoscopic virtues, yeah. But it is safe and passed by the FDA to be safe, and erosion rate is anything between less than 1% to 2%, and only two papers code 4%, majority of papers are less than 1%, or up to two percent and pass by FDA to be type two mesh, type two device. There's no need for uh, post uh, fall up as though uh, like a mini mini sling, single incision sling, or the meshes is type three device. Need to have pre and post uh, marketing uh, follow up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So maybe just a last question. Um, okay. So. I don't know how, how, if you still experience the situation when patients come into the ward, they come in full-blown acute kidney failure, and you just have a peak and you get, you get referred to because they found a prolapse, a huge procedential. Yeah. Um, so with this patient, a viable cause would be to insert a gel horn pastry? Yeah. Procedential? Well, the AKI I think, I think we will, yes, because you'd be surprised sometimes high, high creatine, high urea, with um, yeah. sometimes even the uh, urosepsis, I think you have no choice but to treat it with, with uh, antibiotics and then uh, you have to put in something to try and reduce the mechanical obstruction. And mm -hmm. hopefully in time it will resolve and then you can think about getting a fit for surgery and the coprochlysis in such patients with an ideal operation if need be. Like, otherwise, continue with the gel on pastry. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, how fast would you expect the hydronephrosis to resolve? It may take sometimes about uh, anything from one to three weeks. Okay, one to three weeks. Um, would you think there's a rush to perform the surgery? Um, reason I'm asking no, you. No, have no. Because I think a lot of these patients have bacteremia, yeah. septicemia. They, I think they need to be treated. Uh, there's no urgency because they are, other problems are there. It all depends how long this, this prolapse has been there. If a long time prolapse, then they may be ending in a near bladder failure or kidney failure and all that may not, may not resolve. And they may then have continued high residual urines and uh, problems with hydrogen in the process. It may not resolve completely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just a last question from the audience. How often, um, I think this comes back to pastry care. So how often do you change the gel horn pastry? Uh, maybe back to Dr. Kong. I'll probably say initially when um, it's fitted in. So anything from four to six months. But I think it really depends on whether they do present with the complications of uh, gel horn. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're finding it more and more difficult to change it or they're getting discomfort, they're getting more complaints of more discharge, bleeding, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, ulcerations, for example, then I'll probably bring them back a little bit earlier. So, um, yeah, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Um, mm -hmm. I think despite having used, obviously, world, you know, as, mm -hmm. as worldwide, we use pessaries and they've been using it for years, for decades. There's actually very little um, uh, research done into what is the optimal time to changing a pessary. I mean, it ranges anything from three to six to nine months. And I think the only thing I could find um, was there was a study from, I think it was, I can't remember which country, but basically they said up to nine months was fine as long as the patient was comfortable. Okay. So there's no hard and fast rule. I think it's a matter of obviously getting to know your patient, what suits her, what works for her, what is the time interval that actually, you know, results in the least sort of complaints and complications and makes the, the, the change of uh, gel horn easy for yourself. <laughs> yeah, so depending on individual. Yeah. Much yeah. Great. Okay. Um, okay, this is a complicated question, but we might just take this one as the last question. How would you avoid uretric injury in a huge stage four POP surgery? Any tips? Mm, maybe Dr. Roy? I think if you're doing it vaginally, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, once you dissect circumferential incision of bladder, you dissect, uh, you dissect your bladder up. As long as bladder has gone out of the way, the complications are in fact much less because uh, you then uh, 
once your bladder is dissected, you use a big speculum, like a, a big same speculum to protect the bladder. So I think it's less likely than doing it even um, from the top because uterine injuries are more common from any, any surgery abdominally because the ureters are in fact in the way. Here the ureters are being pulled upwards. So it's less likely to have uretric injuries. With, uh, as long as you're as long as you're dissecting, you're in the right plane and getting the bladder out of the way, and then uh, yeah, you must push the bladder well away. It can be there laterally because the bladder can actually be on the side instead of just anterior wall. Can even go sometimes to the back. I think that that's what uh, this this doctor is meaning. There's a possibility that it can be injured. So the bladder sometimes, uh, if you see anything yellow, then it's a bladder. I'll just add to that. Actually, I'll just take it one step back. It's more, for me, it's actually the pre-op preparation. It's very important to reduce this stage four prolapse, um, be it with a vaginal pack or with a gel horn. Yeah. Um, that would um, reduce uh, the edema. edema um, certainly, that would yeah. make a huge difference. It'll, your yeah. um, surgical planes will be a lot Maybe. easier. Yeah. The, it'll be a lot more vascular, uh, less vascular. Um, so I think it's very much a preparation. So for all my stage fours, I would um, either reducing with a gel horn or with a vaginal pack. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Because otherwise, a very elemental source of bleeding, very difficult to stop the bleeding, oozing and all that. So patients are rushing for surgery, but sometimes having a blood for years. So if you hang on for a few months, I think it's better. And some topical detergents as well on the lump outside, I can reduce it to be good. Yeah. Um, I don't think it really actually even takes months. I think just a matter of few days, months, sometimes uh, they yeah. do make a huge difference. So I think just, um, and of but of course, you know, if you're going to just do vaginal packing, they cannot retain a gel horn. Yeah. In these women, it may well be that you have to admit them as an inpatient because for sure, within the first 24, 48 hours after packing, this pack is going to get dislodged. It's going to fall out. Um, and with that packing, I would probably put a CBD in, a uh, uh, continuous um, uh, urethral catheterization. It's just really to try and reduce the edema again to the bladder being full, yeah. Yeah? but also to minimize their uh, trips to the toilet because each time they're upright, this thing is uh, more likely to fall out. Yeah. But of yeah. course, you can't, yeah. you, you can't stop them from opening their bowels. So you just got to give them some instructions just to make sure they don't strain. Yeah. Okay. I think the problem we, uh, sometimes the packing takes a few weeks. So sometimes you do it in outpatient three times a week. They have to wear a pad and tell them to make sure that they use a finger to push, make sure to keep the, the pack in. Uh, otherwise, the pack may drop out quite easily. Uh, so that, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, can I ask something? Uh, okay, yep. no, uh, to, to prevent the ureters it, uh, injury during the surgery, during the surgery right? I would one of the most important things you have to push pushing the uterus down. Mm -hmm. Keep tracking while juicing and keep clamping close to the uterus as much as possible and retract the bladder up to pull up the bladder and the ureter mm -hmm. going up. Yeah. Pull down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pulling. Pull down, and push, pull down and push, pull down the uterus. Push up the bladder. On the traction. Push up the bladder and pull down, <laughs> okay. the, pull down the uterus. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I think we might need to close the session. We've uh, overrun by two minutes, which is fine. So um, thank you very much to our panelists. So Dr. Roy, Dr. Suvit, and Dr. Kong Su Yen for putting aside the time from your busy schedule to share with us your knowledge and expertise in the area of urogynecology. So uh, we can't thank you enough. And thank you again to uh, OGSM and Hume Lin for coming up and sponsoring this session. And also thank you to the OGSM team in office right now with Dr. Kong, um, Clarence and Prema and I believe Baskarin yeah, for your kind assistance and making this um, session a success. So we hope all of you will have a good festive season at the end of the year and um, stay safe. And hopefully we get to meet in person in the near future. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Merry much. Merry Christmas and happy new year. And thank you. Thank happy you to the audience. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
สวัสดีไหม